Good evening. Will the Standing Committee on Justice please come to order? Before the committee can proceed with the business before it, it must elect a new chairperson. Are there any nominations? Mr. Ginter? Mr. Islison. Mr. Islison has been nominated for chairperson. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, Mr. Islison, will you please take the chair? Hey, good evening, everyone. And our next item of business is the election of a vice chairperson. Are there any nominations? Minister Helwer. Mr. Chair, I nominate uh, Mr. Gunter. Mr. Gunter has been nominated. Any other nominations? Hearing no other nominations, Mr. Gunter is elected vice chairperson. So tonight's meeting has been called to consider the following bills. Bill number two, the Public Services Sustainability Repeal Act. Bill number eight, the Court of Appeal Amendment and Provincial Court Amendment Act. Bill number 15, the Drivers and Vehicles Amendment and Highway Track Amendment Act. Bill number 17, the Family Law Act, the Family Support Enforcement Act, and the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Amendment Act and Bill 21, the Highway Traffic Amendment and Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation Amendment Act. So I would like to start by informing all in attendance of the provisions in our rules regarding the hours of adjournment. A standing committee meeting to consider a bill must not sit past midnight to hear public presentations or to consider clause by clause of a bill except by unanimous consent of the committee. As for written submissions from the following persons have been received and distributed to committee members. James Bedford, the Manitoba Teachers Society on bill number two, and Monique St. Germain, the Canadian Centre for Child Protection on bill number eight. Does the committee agree to have this document appear in the Hansard transcript of this meeting? Agreed and so ordered. So prior to proceeding with public presentations, I would like to advise members of the public regarding the process for speaking in a committee. In accordance with our rules, a time limit of 10 minutes has been allotted for presentations, with another five minutes allotted for questions from committee members. If a presenter is not in attendance when their name is called, they will be dropped to the bottom of the list. If the presenter is not in attendance when their name is called a second time, they will be removed from the presenter's list. The proceedings of our meetings are recorded in order to provide a verbatim transcript. Each time someone wishes to speak, whether it be an MLA or a presenter, I first must say the person's name. This is a signal to Hansard recorders to turn the mics on and off. On the topic of determining the order of public presentations, I will note that we do have out-of-town presenters in attendance, and they are marked with an asterisk on your list. With these considerations in mind, in what order does the committee wish to hear presentations? Uh, Mr. Weeb. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd recommend, uh, as uh, is our normal practice, to allow for those out-of-town presenters to uh, go first. Uh, I guess that would just apply, though, to those out-of-town presenters that are in attendance here tonight. Maybe I'll get some clarification, but I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay. Yeah. If, if it is the will of the committee to go with out-of-town presenters who are in person, then we, we can certainly do so, if that is what you're, you're proposing. Okay. Are there anything else? Is that agreed? Okay, thank you for your patience, agreed. And so we will now proceed with our public presentation. Okay, so I will now call on Mr. Kevin Rebeck from the Manitoba Federation of Labor. Okay, so if you can drop me 
Yeah, I will. Just wait till these get out. So as your report is going out, I will now call on uh, Mr. Rebeck to start your presentation, sir. Thank you, and it's nice to, to be in person. It's been a while. Um, the Manitoba Federation of Labour, the MFL, is Manitoba's central labour body, representing some 30 affiliated unions and the interests of more than 125,000 unionized workers. Manitoba's unions have stood in opposition to the Public Service Sustainability Act, the PSSA, since it was first introduced as Bill 28 in the spring of 2017. Since your government was elected, we were clear with you that Manitoba could balance the budget along with your government's eight stated eight-year timeline without interfering in the collective bargaining process and unilaterally freezing the wages of over 120,000 dedicated and hardworking Manitobans. And we were clear with Brian Pallister and the rest of you from day one that this law should be repealed, or better yet, that it should never have been introduced in the first place. So I'm not here tonight to praise you for being late to the game. At a time when Manitobans are working hard, but finding it harder and harder to get ahead, you've deliberately stood in the way of public sector workers as they tried to bargain fair contracts with their employers. These are people who have to feed their kids, pay their rent or mortgage, pay taxes, and spend money in the local economy, just like any other Manitoban. I know your government's looking to get some credit for taking steps to repeal a law that should never have been passed in the first place a law that each and every member of the PC caucus voted for, including Premier Stephenson. The fact is, your government's decisions have hurt working families. You've hurt the public services that we all rely on. And you've made a mess of the collective bargaining process in the public sector. You, all of you, unilaterally froze the wages of nurses, pandemics, paramedics, healthcare aides, teachers, school bus drivers, school custodians, group home staff, social workers, snowplow drivers, construction workers, plumbers, electricians, and many others. The PSSA has negatively impacted 120,000 working families, people who work hard every day to deliver the public services that we all count on, and it continues to harm workers even now, at a time when working families are seeing sharp increases at the pumps, at the grocery stores, and in the price of basically everything else we need to live, work, and raise a family. To protect the right to collective bargaining, in July of 2017, a coalition of Manitoba's unions with members who work in the public services impacted by the PSSA joined together to form the Partnership to Defend Public Services and challenge the PSSA in court. Well, the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench ruled in 2020 that the PSSA was unconstitutional, calling the law draconian, the Manitoba Court of Appeal overturned that decision in 2021. Through the strength and solidarity of working people, since our initial victory at the Court of Queen's Bench, Manitoba's unions have been able to settle over 80 collective agreements above the terms of the PSSA through a combination of strikes, binding arbitrations, and negotiations. But even today, five years later, tens of thousands of public sector workers are working under expired contracts because of the mess that this law and your government have caused to the collective bargaining process in our province. There are the people who provide the, these are the people who provide the services that Manitoba families count on every day. They are people who we relied on through the COVID-19 pandemic, who you all said were heroes, and yet while you're publicly calling them heroes, you froze their wages and ripped up their right to collectively bargain fair contracts with their employers. We all know that actions speak louder than words, and you failed to actually stand up and support working families in the province. In previous decisions, the Supreme Court of Canada has said that the right to collective bargaining is protected under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As we have said all along, the right to collective bargaining is the right to a process, not to the outcome of an agreement. And that's fine, because bargaining is what we do. We believe in it, and we know it works when the process is fair, and collective bargaining works for several reasons. First, it requires workers to come together and prioritize things such as benefits, safer working conditions, fair wages, retirement plans, and then negotiate their narrowed down list with their employer. Second, collective bargaining requires compromise. Just as employers don't want to see their operations halted, workers don't want to see the services they provide affected, or the paychecks their families rely on disappear. Lastly, 
The process provides stability for workers and employers through the life of the contract. All along, we said we want this law off the books and for government to get out of the way and let workers and employers bargain because it's a process that works when it's allowed to work free from government interference. As you know, the Partnership to Defend Public Services has asked the Supreme Court to give us an opportunity to hear our appeal of the Manitoba Court of Appeal decision as there are important matters of law regarding the charter rights of workers to collective bargaining still to be settled. As Manitoba's Court of Queen's Bench and Court of Appeal issued drastically different rulings, we believe it's essential to have the laws made clear for everyone by the Supreme Court. If you're actually interested in anything other than following in Brian Pallister's footsteps to repair the damage you've done, you need to do a whole lot more than just repeal the law. If the Stephenson government is serious about wanting to reset the relationship with workers and unions, you need to do two important things immediately. First, stop interfering in public sector bargaining, both through this law and through micromanaging what employers can bargain through restrictive mandates. It's shameful that tens of thousands of workers have been without a contract for years because of this government. Second, withdraw your opposition to the PDPS application to have the Supreme Court consider the constitutionality of your government's wage freeze legislation. Let the highest court in the country decide if this law is unconstitutional or not. You can't pretend that repealing this is about resetting the relationship while you're also trying to prevent the Supreme Court from hearing our case. The COVID-19 pandemic has only highlighted how important public sector workers and the services they provide are, and they're important to all of us. While your government has been calling these workers heroes, you haven't been treating them with respect. Costs are going up across the board these days, and it's getting harder for working families to keep up. You should be investing in the public services that keep life affordable and the public sector workers that we all count on. We know that collective bargaining works when it's fair, it's a tried and tested process that allows workers and employers to reach fair deals that make sense for both sides. But it only works if government allows it to happen freely and fairly. We urge you to get out of the way of the collective bargaining process in the public sector. Let the people who know their workplaces best come together and hammer out fair deals that both sides can live with. The PSSA should never have been introduced in the first place. Simply repealing it now will not undo all the damage you've caused to working families in our province. And in order to start making a difference in the lives of working people, you need to take concrete and meaningful steps like the one I outlined tonight. It's time for your government to start working for working families. Thank you. And I thank you very much for your presentation. Do members of the committee have questions for the presenters? Minister Helwer? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Rebeck, for your presentation. I believe we lost your audio, Mr. Helwer. Try that. All right, we'll try that again. So sorry about that. Minister Howard, um, so thank you, Mr. Rebeck. So uh, thanks for your presentation. Good words. Uh, as you know, we're repealing this piece of legislation and we feel it's time uh, to move on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rebeck. Well, that's being repealed, but there's more that needs to be done. As I've laid out, that there are still tens of thousands of workers who've been without a contract since this whole process started um, and government uh, has impeded collective bargaining along the way. Um, repealing this bill is a good first step, but it needs to be followed very quickly with getting out of the way and letting collective bargaining happen. And I'm hopeful that you and other members of your caucus will support that and make that a reality. Uh, Mr. Weeb. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Rebeck, for coming here tonight. I know that uh, you personally, but uh, the MFL in general and labor uh, uh, across the board have been incredibly active uh, in standing up against this kind of legislation, as you said, taking it all the way to court and fighting on behalf of all working people in Manitoba. You know, obviously here we are now with uh, Bill 2, a, a very thin, very simple bill, uh, just simply repealing uh, this bad legislation that the government had put forward. Why did you feel it was necessary for you to come here tonight to give even more time uh, to this process? 
what are some of the messages that you want to send to working people about what they can do and what we all need to do to ensure that this kind of thing doesn't come uh, uh, before the legislature again? Mr. Rebeck. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I did feel it was incredibly important to come and speak to this bill. It is repealing the law. That's something we've asked for all along. But that quite simply isn't enough to make the real difference that, that, and undo the damage that even introducing this law has caused. We've been through court, uh, Queen's Bench, and a Court of Appeal now. We've gotten two radically different rulings. We believe it needs to be heard at the Supreme Court, and this government's uh, not supporting that call to the Supreme Court for them to hear this case and to give some real answers for what the rules of engagement are when it comes to collective bargaining. Uh, we think collective bargaining is a very fair process. It even has rules for when things break down and sides can't come to an agreement, how we move forward and get an agreement. No one wants to have strikes or lockouts. People want to have a deal and people can reach them, but not if government's interfering in the way that this government has. Um, we've had a, an individual case with the University of Manitoba where we knew this government illegally interfered in the bargaining process very clearly and was proven in court. And we worry that there's been too much of that kind of interference that has impeded uh, working families uh, being able to get collective agreements and deals and so many are working under expired contracts. It's hugely problematic. So I thought it was important to come and deliver that message today. Thank you. Ms. Fontaine. Miigwech, uh, Mr. Rubik, for being here tonight and to present to the committee. I, I don't really have a question. It's more of a comment and a reflection on your presentation. I think that it is so important for citizens, for Manitobans to come forward and to share um, how damaging this piece of legislation has been. And you did so in your presentation when you said 120,000 Manitobans were impacted by this piece of legislation that each and every one of these members sitting here celebrated, were so excited about. And now we have a minister who wants to forget about all of that history, all of the damage that they've done to Manitobans. And his line is that it's time to move on. And so I hope that the members here tonight I would welcome the members that are participating from the PC caucus to, you know, clip your comments, uh, show it in, ca in caucus, so that each and every one of them here and in their whole caucus knows how damaging this legislation is and that they should be ashamed of themselves. Miigwech. Mr. Rebeck. Thank you. Yes, we're just, uh, we still have members today, far too many that are sitting there waiting for answers at the bargaining table, that have fallen further and further behind as inflation and costs have gone up. Uh, the same people that we've called and this government has called heroes, uh, but they sure haven't treated them like that. And uh, we do hope that it's more than just repealing this law, that, that government takes concrete steps and takes action to show that they're prepared to let bargaining happen freely, fairly, and let uh, the experts, workers and employers, negotiate the deals that are fair. Thank you, and we thank you for your comments, and we've run out of time. So thank you again for your presentation this evening. So going down our list, this is going to be a little complicated based on the move that was placed forward. I have the list of out-of-town presenters in front of me, but I'm not sure if any more are in the room. Do we have any more out-of-town presenters in the room? So seeing none, then we will just continue down our list then. We have uh, Mr. Kyle Ross from uh, the Manitoba Government and General Employees Union. Uh, Mr. Ross, if you could turn your camera on. So, Mr. Ross. Yes. You understand he is on. So we'll just wait until we can uh, see the camera. There we go. Thank you and good evening, uh, Mr. Ross, and the floor is yours. Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Chairperson and Honourable Members. My name is Kyle Ross, President of the Manitoba Government and General Employees Union. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the bill tonight. The MG represents 32,000 working Manitobans who live and work throughout Manitoba in a wide variety of workplaces. 
including employment employed directly by the province of Manitoba, Crown Corporations, universities and colleges, healthcare facilities, social service agencies, and arts and culture organizations. The vast majority of our members have been impacted by, this restrict, by the restrictive measures imposed by Bill 28, the Public Services State Sustainability Act. And they continue to deal with the fallout to this day. We strongly oppose this regressive anti-worker legislation when it was introduced in 2017, and we continue to call for the free and fair collective bargaining. The reality is that thousands of workers continue to work with expired contracts as a direct result of the delays in the collecting bargaining process. Thousands more were forced through agonizing, protracted negotiations and accepted contracts under duress. The public service, the dedicated workers who supported the COVID pandemic response in public health, statisticians who tracked the virus, sheriff's officers, conservation officers, and highway workers clearing snow on our roads have all been disrespected through the process. What our members want is respect and meaningful investments in the service that Manitobans rely on because public services are only as strong as those delivering them. The consequences of Bill 28 have become a wave of, of recruitment and retention issues that are impacting the quality of service that Manitobans rely on as wage rates fall further behind and rapidly rising across the living. Senior public servants with years of experience are choosing to retire as no improvements to wages or working conditions are on the horizon. Leaving with, leaving with valuable institutional knowledge and experience. MGU members continue to report that they are doing more with less, often working the jobs of two and three people as budgets are further constrained and vacancies go unfilled as the demand for services grow. Bill 28 had a large role to play in this erosion of these services. We strongly agree with the repeal of this legislative attack on bargaining rights. But the irrepar irreparable harm that this legislation has had on our members cannot be minimized. As a first step, we call on your government to fully restore productive and meaningful collective bargaining. I'm not here to tell you that negotiations are easy. They aren't. Difficult choices need to be made on both sides of the table. But the compromises that are reached and these agreements that are signed provide stability for the employer and for workers. Collective bargaining works. Secondly, we call on your government to not oppose the application to have the Supreme Court consider the constitutionality of your government's wage freeze legislation. We want the courts to rule on, this constitu on the constitutionality of the Bill 28. There is lots of work to do since Premier Stephens has been sworn in. We have heard some encouraging signals to reset the relationship your government has with workers. We want to do that too. But trust is something that takes time to build and we are committed to doing the work through fair collective bargaining and any other table we are invited to. We urge you to forge a new path, a different approach that works for working families. Thank you for your time. And I thank you, Mr. Ross, for your comments. Uh, the floor is open for questions for committee members. Uh, Minister Helwer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ross, for your presentation. Good to see you again, even if it is virtually. And uh, we appreciate your, your comments. And yes, it does indeed uh, take time to build trust. And that's uh, where we're, we're working on these days. Thank you. And Mr. Ross. Thank you, Honorable Mr. Hillier. I think we have lots of work to do. And I think our members have been impacted by this legislation. And I really hope you guys can see in your way to not oppose us at the Supreme Court. Our members have felt the pain of this. And I really appreciate you guys taking time to listen. Mr. Weeb. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ross, for, uh, for coming to, uh, to committee virtually here this evening. I think it's incredibly important to hear from you uh, as you represent uh, so many working people in this province. And uh, as you've outlined, uh, so many folks that have been impacted to such a, a high degree. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could just you know, give us a snapshot um, of how uh, how this bill, how Bill 28 continues to impact your members, you know, especially considering, I guess, you know, the impacts of inflation and, uh, and cost of living increases that we've seen. How is it that the, uh, the legislation that was brought forward uh, in the past, how does that continue to affect your members uh, even today? Mr. Ross. Well, this legislation chilled all the tables for bargaining. So which without bargaining or continued ongoing bargaining, some contracts out of date four years. So we have members working on wages from four years ago with the cost of inflation continuing to rise. So they've 
really seen their buying power and their ability to enjoy life decrease. It's been very challenging for them. And this legislation was a big piece of that. And it was really caused our members to suffer where we just want to get to the table and bargain and get to a good deal where both sides can have some stability and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gerard. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Kyle, <clears throat> for your presentation, uh, which was very good. Uh, you have talked about this uh, former legislation or the legislation that's being repealed as causing waves of resignations and retirements. And I just wondered if you've had any estimates of how many people have resigned or retired. And, and also, uh, we heard a few minutes ago about a lot of workers still with expired contracts. Do you have uh, workers with expired contracts uh, in your union? Mr. Ross? Thank you for the question. Yes, we have many with workers with expired contracts and we have seen our civil service members shrink by close to 3,000 members. So we have many members doing the jobs of two and three people in the civil service. It's been largely due to the stagnant wages where there's opportunities to go elsewhere. And these are great people that do great work and it's been very challenging for them and they care about what they do. So when they try to do this work and they're tr killing themselves basically to get this work done, because it needs to be done because they want to do well for Manitobans. It's been very challenging for our members. And thank you for the question. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, Mr. Ross, thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, Ms. Darlene Jackson from the Manitoban Nurses Union. And get you to turn your camera on and we'll proceed when you're ready. And welcome, Ms. Jackson. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. First, let me extend my thanks to the committee chairperson and committee members for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today on Bill 2, the Public Services Sustainability Repeal Act. Speaking as the president of the Manitoba Nurses Union, I can definitively say that this bill, which repeals the Public Services Sustainability Act, PSSA, is a step in the right direction. That said, it will take more than a repeal of the PSSA to repair the damage done by it to the relationship between public sector workers like nurses and this government. The decision of the PC government to pass the PSSA early in their tenure clearly signaled to public sector workers that the new government viewed them as nothing more than a cost to be controlled in their dogged pursuit of a balanced budget. It signaled that the government did not care how much service or dedication these employees just demonstrated. They were simply a burden on the government's books. It also showed that they were willing to essentially cut real wages for these workers by way of imposing arbitrary wage freezes disconnected from and showing no regard for the effects of inflation. The MNU, whose members were expecting at the time to bargain new contracts to replace the ones that had expired on March 31st, 2017, were sideswiped by the passage of the PSSA. In an effort to defend our members against a bill that violated their charter rights, we joined with other unions in the partnership to defend public services. With that, a long legal battle began. One that had yet to conclude, one that has yet to conclude, and which does not simply end with the repeal of PSSA. Let me be clear: I am here today to support passage of the bill which will repeal the PSSA. However, I am also here to say that if the government wishes to build a more positive relationship with nurses and other public sector workers and begin to repair the substantial damage created by the PSSA, they must also show us they are willing to let the highest court of our land make a final determination on the constitutionality of the PSSA. To simply repeal it without also supporting the objective of a final ruling that will provide clarity on the ability of governments to pass such laws will leave a wound to that relationship. Nurses want to know if this can ever happen again. All unionized public sector workers deserve some closure on this issue. 
Such closure should only come from a final ruling from the highest court in the land. The psychological and financial toll of the PSSA saga has been high on all parties involved and needs to come to a definitive conclusion. For the MNU, the PSSA, along with the Hasbura representation votes and government restructuring of health care, set off a drawn out multi year battle for a new collective agreement and led to unnecessarily complicated and lengthy negotiations. The effect of the PSSA was having it on health care employers' approach to bargaining was undeniable, despite the bill never been proclaimed. Once passed, Employers knew they were expected by the government to freeze and dra drastically minimize any wage increases in the new collective agreements going forward. The legal challenge surrounding the bill was undoubtedly a factor in why it took employer health care employers so long to finally come to the table and began negotiating in October 2020 with Manitoba nurses, who had been without a collective agreement for 3.5 years at this time. In fact, we had to threaten to file an unfair labor practice just to get the employers to commit to sit down with us and truly begin negotiating in October 2020. Of course, that's not the end of the saga. After reaching an impasse in spring of 2021, we ended up having to strike an agreement to bring a mediator on board for the remainder of the negotiations and to secure a right to arbitration were the mediation to fail. In order to get a mediator and a commitment to arbitration, if it became necessary, our members had to relinquish their right to strike during this round of bargaining. And I'd like to point out they had overwhelmingly voted to strike before this agreement for mediation and arbitration was made. Nurses had voted that way not because they wanted to go on strike, because, but because that was the only way to get government to seriously bargain with them and reevaluate its unacceptable position. By the time the Manitoba Nurses Union got an uh, agreement, they agreement. The employers had massive retroactive calculations and payments to make. Nurses who were already exhausted from their tireless service during the ongoing COVID pandemic only got this agreement after extreme frustration and inordinate amounts of time and resources dedicated to bargaining and mediation. Can you imagine how it must feel to be working harder than ever before, providing a critical service during an exceptionally difficult time, facing the prospect of contracting COVID or carrying it home to your loved ones, and then having to fight that hard to get the government to recognize your value in some tangible way. I can assure you it leaves a bad taste in one's mouth. That is why I urge you today to pass this bill. But furthermore, as a real sign of a willingness to repair the relationship with nurses and other public sector workers, I urge you to support a hearing on the legality of the PSSA by the Supreme Court of Canada. Manitoba nurses know that repealing the bill today does not prevent this government or a future government from introducing the same or similar legislation at some later point in time. Manitoba nurses should not have to continue to worry about this possibility. We deserve closure. Supporting our request for the Supreme Court to rule on this bill, should they choose to, is the path for this closure. Thank you. Let me thank you for your presentation. The floor is now open for questions. Minister Helwer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Jackson, for your presentation. And I certainly agree this uh, is a step in the right direction. We have many steps to take. And uh, again, uh, thank you to your members for all the work that they've done during the pandemic and continue to do as we move ahead here. Uh, Ms. Jackson. Um, I appreciate those words, um, Mr. Helwer, uh, but I, I couldn't urge you more to uh, allow the full process to continue at the Supreme Court. Uh, Mr. Weeb. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Ms. Jackson, for your uh, presentation here today. Uh, you know, we've uh, certainly, as uh, as elected uh, uh, MLAs, uh, hear day in and day out from nurses in our own communities who are, um, you know, frustrated, uh, feel completely burnt out and overworked, 
And, uh, you know, to add to all that list of frustrations that they have with the mismanagement within the, uh, the healthcare system and the disrespect that they've felt from this government, uh, on top of all of that, of course, they've had to deal with this um, uh, uh, ultimate disrespect when it comes to, uh, to the bargaining process. So I appreciate you bringing that forward here. Obviously, um, it is uh, a still a difficult time for nurses uh, in our uh, healthcare system. Can you talk about what impact this, uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, uncertainty that's been created by the government has had in terms of the number of overall nurses who are still in the system uh, versus you know, those who maybe have just decided enough is enough and uh, taking retirement, taking positions elsewhere, and just said uh, they've had enough with, uh, with the situation in Manitoba. Can you give me a sense of what the impact has been uh, because of legislation like this? Ms. Jackson. Uh, yes, I can. Thank you for the question, Mr. Weeb. Um, I can tell you that this, the, that this bill and the lengthy protracted uh, negotiations and the uh, four and a half years without a collective agreement had a huge impact on Manitoba nurses. We saw a mass exodus of nurses who uh, left the system uh, probably working harder than they ever had before and felt they were not valued, they were not acknowledged and not respected at all. Uh, by this government. So we now have, we know, more than 2,500 vacant nursing positions in this province. Uh, we do know that we, uh, in the province of Manitoba, almost hit a million hours of overtime last year, 992,000 hours of overtime. And we know that our agency nurse use has skyrocketed to over 505,000 hours. Uh, so this has had a massive impact on nurses, and I believe that it's going to continue to have an impact until we can uh, actually uh, retain and recruit nurses in this system. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Mr. Gerard. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we've got, uh, as you have already mentioned, a, uh, a real shortage of nurses at the moment, uh, more than 2,500. Uh, there was impacts from a lot of things. Uh, what uh, proportion of that impact do you think came from this bill? And uh, uh, as a result of this bill, uh, uh, was that a, a major factor in uh, uh, so many nurses leaving? Ms. Jackson? Um, I, think it was, I think it definitely was a, a major factor. We had many, many nurses who were basically hanging on to see uh, you know, to uh, look at the new collective agreement and uh, based on its merit, make decisions. And what happened was after four and a half years, we just had nurses saying, I can't work in this system any longer. I cannot do this and I can't wait for a new collective agreement. So our question is, is, had we been able to negotiate a collective agreement and had there not been uh, Bill 28 looming above the employer's heads, would we have managed to uh, retain nurses in the system with a good collective agreement? Yes, I believe we would have. Any further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much for your presentation. We'll now move on to uh, our fourth presenter, uh, Ms. Jennifer Carr, President of the Professional Institute of the Public Service Canada. Ms. Carr, I just ask you to turn on your video when you're ready. Ms. Carr, welcome, and uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Committee members. My name is Jennifer Carr, and I'm the President of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. With me is Mr. P Pierre Ouellette, our negotiator for PIPS provincial members, and a labour relations specialist who can help answer your questions today. We thank you for the opportunity to present in this important discussion. PIPS is the bargaining agent for some 60,000 public service professionals across the country, the majority of whom are employed in the federal government. But we also represent over 150 members of the province of Manitoba Association of Government Engineers, otherwise known as the MAGE Group. 
Until recently, we also represented many healthcare professionals in the province who are now represented by another union following the forced amalgamation of provincial bargaining units. So we've always kept a close eye on the labor situation in Manitoba. Back in 2017, like other provincial public sector bargaining agents, we were totally against the Public Services Sustainability Act that was introduced by the government of the day. Bill 28 was nevertheless imposed on hundreds of thousands of hardworking public servants. Provincial and federal governments in Canada have had a long and controversial history of resorting to legislation to impose wage restraints on their employees and to restrict their collective bargaining rights. Bill 28 was a particularly nasty example of this sort of legislation. In our view, it violated both the Canada Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Canada's international obligations without reasonable justification. So while we are pleased that it is on the road to being appealed, it is critical that, critical that going forward, no government in Canada should be able to use legislation to interfere in the process of meaningful collective bargaining and infringe on the association of freedom as protected by the Charter S2D. Let's not forget that the Supreme Court of Canada has made it clear that the process of collective bargaining is protected by the Charter. I know that the provincial government doesn't want to move this through the, the courts. It says that the act will be repealed, so why bother? But in fact, it is absolutely critical that the issue be resolved once and for all. Public sector workers and Canadians need to know, know the constitutional ground, ground rules of collective bargaining. Are governments at liberty to enact wage freeze legislation at any time to obtain monetary outcomes they desire without engaging in a collective bargaining process? Can they avoid charter scrutiny by withdrawing the legislation at the 11th hour? These are the questions of public importance that ought to be answered by the Supreme Court of Canada, and we fully support the Manitoba Federation of Labour's action on this front. Dedicated public servants have continued to deliver public services to Manitobans, Manitobans and Manitobans counted on these services throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. This has only highlighted how important these workers and these services they provide are to all of us. While the government has been calling them heroes, they haven't been treated with respect by their employer. Civil servants have already done their share. Last, last year, when they were faced with the possibility of layoffs, they all agreed to take five days of leave without pay to support the government in the pandemic context. They have already and largely con contributed to assisting it in these matters. They deserve better treatment. So to conclude, we urge the provincial government to stop interfering in public sector bargaining. Tens of thousands of workers have been without a contract for years and it's high time to get them signed deals. And the government must make it a clear and genuine commitment not to oppose the partnership to defund public service application, to have the Supreme Court consider the constitutionality of its wage freeze legislation. Let the highest court in the country decide if this law was unconstitutional or not. I thank you very much for your time today, and we would please to take your questions. And we thank you very much for your presentation. Now, before we proceed with questions and answers with Ms. Kerr, uh, we have received a request that her colleague, a negotiator, Pierre Ouellette, uh, be provide, permitted to help Ms. Kerr answer questions if necessary as a technical advisor. Is there leave to allow Mr. Ouellette to speak on the record as Ms. Kerr's technical advisor if necessary? Leave has been granted. The floor is open for questions. Uh, Minister Helwer. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Carr, for your presentation. Uh, as you uh, stated so eloquently throughout the presentation, we uh, we are trying to move on, and uh, this is one step in that process. Uh, we understand there are many, many more, and uh, thank you for your representation of the uh, Manitoba Association of uh, Government Engineers, I believe, MAGE, I believe, is the acronym there. Thank you. Ms. Carr. Thank you again for uh, for your comments. Um, I would hope that this government will allow us to uh, continue with the um, the application or the to, to the Supreme Court so that we can have this matter finalized once and for all. Thank you, Mr. Weeb. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Carr, for your uh, presentation here this evening. It's uh, incredibly important that uh, we hear from all voices who have been impacted uh, by the PSSA and, and the impacts that it's had on your individual members. So we really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, uh, to join us here this evening. Um, my question is, is with regards to the, uh, to the case that's before the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, can you just talk about how important a step it would be for the government? You know, even here tonight, you know, we have the minister saying he wants to move on and uh, wants to uh, uh, to rebuild the relationship. Uh, how important would it be for him to say here tonight uh, that the government would not be pursuing this uh, at the Supreme Court? And maybe could you just maybe speculate why uh, the government hasn't been willing to do that to this point? Ms. Carr. Thank you for the question. I, I think I, I summarized it in my presentation. It's the fact that if the governments are allowed to put forward legislation to affect collective bargaining while we're at the table and then withdraw them at the 11th hour, it's just a tactic that uh, paralyzes us at the bargaining table. I think it's important that this government commit to just saying that it won't interfere with the, the leave to the Supreme Court, because like I said, it is important for this to, to be decided from the highest court in the land um, you know we are fighting this on many many levels and we think that it's important that we have the day in court to make sure that uh, you know this this type of leg legislation can't interfere with collective bargaining and of public servants in the future thank you uh, mr. Gerard yes uh, thank you for your presentation I, we've heard about the number of people public service who have resigned and retired. But it seems to me from what I'm hearing that there was quite an impact not just on people leaving, but there was an impact on those who stayed in terms of morale, in terms of mental health or wellness, and in, in terms of productivity. I wonder if you could con uh, comment on that. Ms. Carr. I will let Pierre take that question. Thank you. Mr. Um, um, yeah, thank you very much. The, um, to put just a, a little context around this, uh, the MAGE collective agreement expired uh, back in 2019. And um, it's just, and we're in the process of signing the new collective agreement. It took a number of years just to get things going. And members were faced with possible layoffs and then the five day leave without pay. And all of this we received from the government, an offer of four years, a four year contract at zero you know, percent per year. So the impact on the members, I mean, you have no idea how committed and dedicated this group is to the province of Manitoba and to the population of Manitoba. Going through all this, staying where they are at the moment and still being very proud of being a mage member is just absolutely stunning because I would have expected many people to just leave, but no, they insisted to stay and be a part of the solutions and not the problems. So the impact is huge. And yet uh, this group at PIPS, the mage group, you know, is, is behind this province 100%. And all they're asking now is respect. That's all there is to it. They want to be respected for what they do, what they are, who they represent. And I think repealing this legislation is one thing, but it needs to be more than that to restore faith, you know, in this province and in the bargaining process. Thank you. Okay, and we thank you very much for part your participation. And Ms. Carr, thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Okay, so uh, on our list, you will have uh, Mr. Bob Morose. Um, our understanding is he will be late this evening, so we will move him to the bottom of the list. And we'll go with uh, Mr. Paul McKee uh, from Unifor. If you're uh, ready, Mr. McKee, please uh, come to the podium. And if you have any documentation to hand out, uh, we can certainly take care of that for you. Hearing none, welcome. The podium is yours. 
Thank you very much. Just a correct for the record, although I have no idea how it appears in Hansard, but the pronunciation of my last name is Mackay. Rhymes with pie as an apple or 22 over seven, take your choice. So good evening. I'm here tonight representing Unifor, the largest private sector union in Canada. Our 315,000 members work coast to coast to coast in all sectors of the economy, including workers in the public sector directly and indirectly. We represent about 10,000 Manitoba workers, including publicly funded workers at Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries, Lord Selkirk School Division, Manitoba Hydro, and the University of Manitoba. I'm the area director for Manitoba and Saskatchewan, as well as a servicing representative in Manitoba in charge of 20 collective agreements. My comments today will be relatively brief, perhaps not as brief as Bill 2, which is amongst the shortest bills I've ever seen. Even the explanatory note to this bill is exceedingly small. This bill repeals the Public Services Sustainability Act, which is unproclaimed, and three other legislative references to it. So I'm here today not to praise this government for the repeal of a horrible piece of legislation, but to mark the close of an anti-union, anti-worker campaign supported by every elected member of this government. This was a war on labor, and it was a disaster. This war on organized workers exposed the lie that wage restraints were done for economic reasons. This wasn't about helping the provincial economy. It was about hurting public sector workers and their take-home pay. This was more about payback than it was about paycheck. So I'm not here to pat you on the back for taking back the Public Services Sustainability Act. Perhaps in a more charitable moment, I might slow clap you out of the room. While it is nice to see the death knell for this atrocious legislation, it is a matter of too little, too late. The damage wrought by the PSSA is done. You cannot unring that bell. The legacy of the PSSA is vitriol, vexation, and very, very expensive litigation. This act wasn't here a long time, but it did so much damage. This government and publicly funded employers this government directs enforce the wage restraints of the PSSA. You may repeal this act tomorrow, but I represent workers who still work under collective agreements foisted upon them by this government and the PSSA. Long after the PSSA vanishes, it lingers on in the poor paychecks of Manitobans. This government has painted a picture of public sector workers as overpaid and underworked. It's so many workers funded by public money make wages that are far less than six figures. School bus drivers, food services workers, part-time workers in casinos, all have felt the sting of repressive wage legislation. A sting made even worse, compounded by COVID. In some of the cases I mentioned, I'm now in bargaining to renew collective agreements where wages have fallen behind the rate of inflation by more than 11 and half percent. My workers are angry. They're angry at their employer and they're angry at this government. Some have opted to leave their employment to seek better work elsewhere in the private sector. They leave not because they want to, but because they have to. Some in this government may applaud the initiative to better oneself and seek employment in the private sector, but this ignores the very necessary and good work that public sector and civil service workers do every day. That work gets harder and harder to do when you cannot attract and retain workers to make Manitoba work. How many good workers left for greener pastures because of the PSSA? We may never know that exact number. The motives for the repeal of this legislation may not be as altruistic as our prem premier has laid out. Certainly it is no secret that Labor's lawsuit against this legislation could be before this nation's Supreme Court. Perhaps this is a Hail Mary move to get the court to refuse Labor's leave to appeal. Nonetheless, we say goodbye and good riddance to the PSSA. This may not be an appealing government, but, to but today at least it is a repealing one. Finally, I wish to thank you for this opportunity to speak out in this forum. I'm very proud of our democratic institutions and practices here, particularly how we allow public debate like this on each piece of legislation that our elected members debate, even bills as short as this one. Thank you for your time. And we thank you for your presentation. The floor is now open for questions. Minister Elwer. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mackay, for your, your comments. And uh, yes, it is a very brief piece of legislation. It has one intent and, and sometimes things are exactly as they seem. This is an intent to repeal the legislation and to move on. It takes uh, two parties to be part of that uh, uh, moving on and we're ready and willing and able to do that. And uh, thank you to your members for being a part of our government employees and we appreciate the work that they've done. Mr. Mackay. In power. Um, yes, it is a first step, and uh, we applaud, however lightly, golf clap perhaps, uh, that you have done this, and we look forward to more progressive measures as we, we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weeb. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mackay, for coming here this evening. Um, I, I think uh, in your short presentation, you really summed it up very, very well, and uh, I think put um, uh, some of the frustration that you're hearing from your members on the record and express that I think very well for the committee. So I, th I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of just uh, blown away that the minister seems to be, you know, putting this on, on labor or on you or on the presenters that have come here tonight that, uh, you know, he's made the first step. Now it's, it's up to you to move on, uh, you know, when we've heard uh, time and time again, the impact that this has not only had over the last number of years, but continues to have. And again, I think you, you laid that out very, very well. So, you know, we've heard over and over again um, that one of the concrete steps that this government could take, that the minister here tonight, in fact, could take, is to publicly say that they would withdraw their opposition to the application that's uh, before the Supreme Court. Do you think that that would be a, a helpful step? Um, or, or maybe I'll just open it up this way, you know, allow you to speculate why would the government be unwilling to do that? Why, what, what, what do you think the motivation behind them not willing to take that step would be? Mr. McKay? I don't think it would surprise anyone in this room to know that I'm a cynic uh, and that I believe that this government uh, hopes that by repealing this legislation that it doesn't go to the Supreme Court. If we don't get a ruling on this, this has, a, uh, this has ramifications beyond just Manitoba. This kind of legislation, in fact, this particular, the Bill 28, was modeled very much on the Nova Scotia legislation. And we need to have a definitive view by our Supreme Court on this legislation to stop governments from interfering in the collective bargaining process. And it will, it, not having an answer is not the answer. We need this to go forward. We need to get a definitive answer from the Supreme Court. Mr. Gerard. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for coming and uh, uh, talking about this legislation and its impact. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that there are still workers who, I guess, had got contracts while this legislation was hanging over their head and are still way behind in where they should have been. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and whether those workers are now having an opportunity to catch up or whether uh, those contracts are still ongoing? Mr. McKay? Those contracts, in, in two of those cases, those contracts I'll be bargaining this year, one of them I have already started. And it remains to be seen whether we can make up for an incredible amount of lost time and money. Um, it, uh, there are certainly uh, collective agreements that are funded directly by this government where there are things like binding arbitration for teachers and that, where that is an option. Uh, it is not an option in a lot of uh, quasi-provincial, uh, like the University of Manitoba, for instance, or lotteries, where that, do that avenue doesn't exist. The only avenue is free collective bargaining. And when you interfere with the the monetary part of bargaining, you stop progress everywhere. It just shuts down bargaining, as the justice uh, rightly put in her decision in the uh, Court of Queen's Bench. So we are trying now, we are just in the sort of beginning steps of going through collective bargaining with those units to see if we can make up for the lost ground, and I don't know how that's going to turn out and what we'll have to do in order for it to turn out for those people. Okay, any further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much for your presentation this evening.
Next, we'll move on to our seventh presenter, Mr. Uh, Jeff Traeger from the United Food and Commercial Workers, Local 832. Mr. Traeger, if you could uh, turn on your camera when you're ready. Welcome, sir, and the floor is yours for your presentation. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, I'm here today uh, to support the Manitoba Federation of Labour's call for this government to withdraw your opposition uh, to our application to go to the Supreme Court, which is how, I've, how I view Bill 2. I, I come before you today as the president of UFCW Local 832, a union representing over 19,000 hardworking members almost exclusively now in the private sector. Uh, and I want an answer uh, for my members and for all Manitobans. I want an answer to the question, has this government been acting in a way consistent with the Constitution of Canada? Despite a leadership change and this government's efforts to project a plan to move forward together, this government has continued to blatantly act against your previous commitments. We were told your government would pursue a balanced budget that didn't hurt families. Instead, families have been directly harmed by the my way or the highway approach to legislation and harmed greatly by the PSSA, even though it wasn't proclaimed. Uh, this damage has been done to working families already. Now they deserve to know if this was your plan all along or if you broke the law of this land. Time and time again, this government proves it has a healthy appetite for helping business and those who have deep pockets while hurting both working Manitoba families and our economy. Freezing public sector wages through the PSSA, canceling the final increase to the security guard minimum wage, putting thousands of Manitoba guards into a similar situation as public sector workers. Our members working in security are experiencing increasingly risky and stressful conditions on the job and their wages are not rising to acknowledge the value of their efforts. Suppressing minimum wage increases, putting us smack dab at the bottom of Canada come this September. This government's lack of meaningful action to support working people has forced Manitobans to make extremely difficult choices for the future of their families. You heard already tonight about nurses leaving Manitoba. We know that a lot of young people are leaving Manitoba because they can't make ends meet on 11.95 an hour and 12.35 will not be any better. This is the true cost of Bill 28. These former Manitobans deserve to know if this government acted unconstitutionally. In the fall of 2020, our Winnipeg School Division bus drivers had to choose between accepting the poor conditions of their workplace and the embarrassing offer included in the Public Services Sustainability Act or to go on strike amidst COVID with kids finally returning to in-class learning so that they could stand up to these conditions. And they did go on strike and they went on strike for nine months and they got a lot better than what they were offered at the bargaining table. So it turned out to be exactly the right thing to do. And that's the message this government is sending workers. When you hurt public sector workers and don't allow unions to bargain fairly, there's a ripple effect throughout Manitoba. Our bus drivers from that school division experienced huge show of support from the families they serve. The parents understood that they had to stand up to these unfair conditions and that it wasn't our members' fault that families were dealing with huge inconveniences. The blame was and still is on this government. Those bus drivers deserve to know if this government acted unconstitutionally. At UFCW, we represent thousands of university students, many who have had their studies interrupted by your government interfering with their professor's ability to earn fair wages, a claim that was proven by the Manitoba Labor Board. People come from around the world to study in Manitoba, and if we can't pay our academics what they're worth, the quality of what we have to offer will soon be down in the dumps right beside your minimum wage. And those students and those professors deserve to know 
if this government acted unconstitutionally. I'm here as a president of a union, but I'm also a citizen, and I want to have good, reliable health care that I can count on. Your government's law has and continues to do incredible harm to our health care system. Before the Healthcare Sector Bargaining Review Act, we represented over 3,000 members working in healthcare in St. Boniface, Grace Hospital, and the Thompson Hospital. Even before COVID came our way, we had healthcare workers worried about their job stability, worried about their ability to provide quality care for Manitobans in need. Our healthcare system relies heavily on thousands of workers, healthcare aides, porters, and so many more, many of whom are only making a few bucks above minimum wage. And guess what? Those workers deserve to know if their government acted unconstitutionally. And we don't need volunteers for our healthcare system. We need to pay workers fairly. We need to invest in the long-term health of our province, their people, and its economy. On behalf of Manitobans, I'm here to advocate for fairness. We've had two very different rulings on your government's wage freeze legislation, and we need the clarity that only having our appeal heard at the Supreme Court will provide. If this is really about moving forward together, you need to look beyond numbers to the people you're hurting, the working families who are the backbone of our province. And now, more than ever, they need a government that makes them a priority. When is the Stephenson government going to do that? And guess what? Every single Manitoban deserves to know if this government acted unconstitutionally. If you repeal the PSSA through Bill 2, You'll be sending a strong message to Manitobans that you know Bill 28 was unconstitutional. And Bill 2 is not an olive branch, as you've been trying to portray it here tonight. But it's a ploy to get the government off the hook. And to be completely frank, Bill 2 is a coward's move. Thank you for your time. And we thank you for your presentation. The floor is now open to questions. Minister Halworth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Traeger. Thank you for your, your presentation. It's very direct. I appreciate directness. directness. Um, I think it's a very bold move myself. Thank you. And we are attempting to move forward, as I've said. And there's opportunities there for all of us. Uh, and it'll take a lot of work. We realize that, but we're ready to do the work. Thank you. My comments, Mr. Traeger? Oh, just that if you're going to... Just that if you're going to move forward on behalf of Manitobans, maybe you want to ask them what they'd like to see. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Weeb. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Traeger, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I appreciated your presentation, particularly because uh, of the breadth of experiences that you can uh, bring to the committee here tonight and, and sort of the, the variety of different um, folks that uh, you represent and uh, and just how this uh, legislation has impacted them. Uh, I think it's uh, important for us to understand that and to hear that directly from you. So I appreciate you uh, bringing that forward. Um, you know, I, I would disagree with the minister. I I don't believe that this is a bold step in, in any fashion, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to simply uh, turn tail and, and run and uh, as you said not really listen to anyone or, or to any of the uh, the working people of this province about how we can do things better um, you know if the if the minister were to take bold action here tonight if there was something that the minister could say or, or could uh, indicate direction from his government that clearly indicated a break from you know the the Brian Pallister uh, uh, government and and uh, and uh, agenda that was brought forward. You know, w you know, with most of the uh, the existing cabinet and caucus in place, I would remind folks. Uh, but if he was to make a, a, a distinct break, what kind of step could he take here tonight that would indicate to you that he's taking this next step seriously and is actually listening to uh, to working people in this province, Mr. Traeger? Well, public consultation would be a good start. Uh, if uh, if they believe that the people of uh, Manitoba are happy with the way uh, the PSSA impacted public sector wages, and by the way, 
really had a very strong impact on private sector uh, wages as well, because we had employers coming to the bargaining table and saying, if if two zeros and 1.5% over four years is, uh, or 1.75, sorry, over uh, four years is good enough for government workers, then it's good enough for people who work at Maple Leaf or people who work at Safeway or people who work at uh, any number of uh, private sector locations. Uh, the government, this government doesn't, I, I don't know, other than having Stephenson's face as the, uh, the person uh, in charge, I, I, I can't tell any difference between the way this government is acting and the way it acted in the past. I don't feel as though this move is an olive branch at all. This is an attempt to get out of a bad ruling from the Supreme Court against the government of Manitoba, uh, you know, a year and a half out from an election. I think it, it reeks. And I think you could start by admitting that that's a part of the motivation uh, if you want to show that you're different from the Pallister government. Mr. Gerard. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I agree with you that uh, you know, we need this Supreme Court ruling to get clarity. Uh, you put this very, very clearly uh, that, and I just want to confirm this, that without that Supreme Court ruling, uh, there is going to be a continuing cloud in the air and continuing uncertainty and that's going to be continuing problems for us uh, in Manitoba in terms of bargaining. Is that right? Mr. Trigger? Exactly right. And what I would say is uh, that if we don't get uh, a ruling on the constitutionality of this kind of legislation, there's nothing stopping a future government from going down the same road. We've had Bill 28 for a number of years now, and it's had a hugely negative impact um, on the wages of uh, private and public sector workers, mostly public sector workers, I will admit, but it's had a huge impact. So uh, if we don't have a ruling from the Supreme Court, what I see happening is this government or one like it in the future, putting forward the same type of legislation so that they can get a three-year break. And then when we call them on it, they say, oh, we're going to repeal it. And we thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Mr. Traeger. Next, we'll move on to uh, Mr. Jason Hawkins. Uh, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins, we'll just ask that you turn your camera on when you're ready for your presentation. Thank you and good evening and welcome. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, the floor is yours. Thank you. Firstly, in healing with this government, after Brian Pallister started the framework of destroying our province, it was obvious when he was elected, there was a clear target on labor and the unions that represent the hardworking Manitobans. I realize no one has a crystal ball, but fast forward from the day the legislation was introduced, this government attacked security guards, healthcare workers, teachers, school bus drivers, among others. Yet when a pandemic hit, these people the government identified as heroes. While our government officials stayed in the safety of their homes, healthcare employees put their lives on the line to protect Manitobans. <clears throat> Yet those employees were not allowed the rights of fair bargaining, fair wage increases. As we have seen in the courts, this bill has not been supported. Repealing this is a good first step in healing the negative feelings this government has placed on the hardworking Manitobans. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. The floor is open for questions. Minister Helwer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Hawkins, for your, your comments. I uh, appreciate we're in a very different time. And that's where we're trying to move uh, move on. And I appreciate your comments. It's a good first step. I certainly agree with that. And there's lots more work to do. Mr. Hawkins. Thank you. Um, I, I want to be clear. It, it's a first step in, in a long road. Um, you know, many of our Manitobans are in hard situations right now, financially, emotionally, uh, physically. You know, our healthcare people are beat down. You know, our hard Manito hardworking Manitobans who protected us in this time deserve the fair right to bargain. Mr. Weeb. 
Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Hawkins, for the uh, the presentation. Uh, though it was uh, uh, sh on the shorter side, it, uh, you certainly got your your passion across, and uh, I certainly see that as the passion that I see from a lot of workers uh, in Manitoba who are frustrated with this government. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask a little bit more about what you're saying about um, you know one step in the in a long road. Uh, the minister now, over and over again, is is standing up and saying, you know. We should move on, workers. Uh, what, what, you know, get over it. Um, what What are some of those steps that this government can take when it comes to this this long road that you talk about that would help to restore some confidence that uh, this government, you know, uh, actually could show some respect to uh, to workers in this province, Mr. Hawkins? Well, I think in starting uh, allowing this to go to the Supreme Court. You know, admitting admitting the government was wrong in introducing this in the first place. It wasn't about protecting Manitobans. It was about attacking uh, our hardworking people. Um, like I said, these are one step in a long road of healing the effects of what this government has done, especially going into a pandemic. Now coming out of it, we should be looking at what we can do for these people. Um, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, every time Mr. Pallister came on to TV, you know, in his news conferences, what he could do for business. There was nothing ever there for what he could do for the working Manitobans. He didn't help working Manitobans. He gave our seniors who already got pension, you know, had pension plans and old age security, he gave them a bump in pay. He didn't give a bump in pay to our hardworking people who, had, who yes, you know, have a decent, a decent wage, but he didn't give it to them because they didn't qualify due to their wages. Yet they were the ones on the front lines affected the most by how, the government did not allow for fair bargaining. Thank you, uh, Mr. Helwer. Mr. Helwer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, something the member said uh, um, to me, uh, he's putting words in my mouth, never tonight or previously, and I want that withdrawn. Have I ever said to any union to get over it? I have said, I appreciate this as a first step, we're moving on. There is a lot of work to do. I would appreciate the member withdrawing the allegation that I said those words. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, any comment? No comment. Yeah, and, and again, uh, as we all know, we're here for the presentation and questions and answers uh, to the presenter. So uh, while you may have your own point on that, Minister Helwer, we're going to move forward to uh, Mr. Gerard. Uh, you've talked about as a somebody who's, who I believe, on the front lines of workers in Manitoba, uh, of the impact emotionally uh, and I guess on people's mental well-being uh, of uh, Bill 28 and the low wages and uh, all the other things that went along with that. I, I would like to have you, if you would, expand on that a little bit. Mr. Hawkins? Well, I mean, let, let's look at our, our you know, uh, assisted living. Let's look at our home, our, our elderly, our assisted living for you know, our, our beloved parents. Look at the low wages that are there. Um, you know, what did we do for them? What did this government do for them? Again, I go back to the point of every every time Mr. Pallister came on to TV, it was what he could do for business. It wasn't what he could do for the hardworking Manitobans. Okay, we thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Move on to our... Uh, I guess our eighth presenter, um, Mr. Eric Thompson from the University of Manitoba Faculty Association. Mr. Thompson, if you could turn on your camera when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, as, uh, my name is Eric Thompson. Um, I'm the vice president of uh, UMFA, the University of Manitoba Faculty Association. I'm uh, an associate professor of history. Um, it's it's my uh, pleasure to 
help represent over uh, 1,250 of my colleagues, uh, professors, instructors, and librarians at the University of Manitoba. And I'll keep my remarks short because uh, a lot of people have spoken the evening's getting late, and many of those people have a broader and deeper knowledge of labor relations than I do. I just wanted to remind uh, the Committee of the History um, here that the Pallister government interfered in our bargaining um, in 2016. Uh, so we felt the PSSA's, uh, the PSSA's spirit before the act was put on the legislative docket. Um, this interference contributed to the strike in 2016 uh, and damaged our members' interests um, as the Court of Appeals has agreed and uh, the uh, Court of Queen's Bench has recently awarded us damages for. Um, the effect of the PSSA festered uh, and contributed to the strike uh, that, that occurred last fall. Um, it continues to complicate our relationship with our um, employer, and it's likely damaged not just you know our relationship with our employer, but the institution, uh, which is sunk in international rankings during all of these years. Um, I know that many ma talented Manitoba students have, have sort of looked at this history of strikes and, and uh, uh, limited resources and poor morale and chosen to pursue their studies elsewhere. I don't know whether they'll really come back. Um, I know that this approach to bargaining caused interruption uh, to my classes and to students' um, education, to the detriment of their quality of education and to their experience at the University of Manitoba. And so therefore I welcome um, this shift in approach represented by the repeal uh, of, of the bill. Um, I hope that the government will drop its opposition to the PDPS's application to the Supreme Court um, so that there's more clarity about the approach that wage restraints um, and how they'll work in collective bargaining in the future. I also hope that the government won't appeal the damages and the remedies um, recently awarded um, to our members and to AMFA by the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench. Um, and while this moves on from the maybe narrow experience of AMFA and the particular experience of the University of Manitoba, I, I urge the government to make it a priority to settle fair um, contracts across the public sector, not only with this legislation repealed, um, but with the damages that are done and have doubtless happened in other workplaces, as we've heard from others, um, to settle fair contracts across the public sector. Um, and so that, that's all I have to say, and I thank you for allowing me to come and say it. Well, we thank you very much for your presentation. The floor is now open for questions. Minister Helwer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, I, I assume, Dr. Thompson? I... Even Professor, but uh, I, I'm Is never it... big on titles, so... Um... Okay, good. <laughs> well, I don't want to offend, so, but thank you for your, your presentation and, and your perspective as a professor at the university. I appreciate you coming to the committee and, and letting us know the impact that it's had on you and your classes. Thank you. Mr. Thompson? Oh, yeah, well, thank you. I, I appreciate the minister's concern. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weeb. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor Thompson, thank you for uh, joining us here this evening. Uh, you know, I think uh, your experience um, uh, has been on the minds of many Manitobans uh, because you've been out there uh, really fighting this, uh, this bad legislation uh, and its impact. And I appreciate you bringing your perspective and, um, you know, laying out some of the impacts that this has had. Uh, not just to the faculty, but to, you know, the impacts to the universities uh, themselves as well, which I think is an important uh, element here. And I appreciate your uh, perspective on that. Can you talk a little bit more about the impact that we've seen on uh, for students in, in this uh, in this province and specifically how the impacts that they felt over the last number of years, you know, on top of uh, just the impacts of COVID, but on top of that, to have to deal with this sort of uncertainty within the classroom. Can you talk about what the impact that will have on the province going forward as we try to recover and restart our economy and come out of this pandemic? Um, any insights that you can give would be appreciated. Mr. Thompson. I, 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 I'm, I'm, thank you for the question. I, I, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I, I, I think teachers and, and university teachers will be dealing with gaps in preparation with um, emotional sort of damage um, 
uh, from COVID for the, you know, I, I don't know, for the rest of my career, I think we'll see generations with different cats and, and different things that need to be uh, made up. It will produce real challenges and hopefully a few opportunities in teaching as well. Later on top of that, there's, of course, these strikes. Um, and, and also, I mean, um, the, the, the effect of the PSSA and the, the constraints on collective bargaining mean that many of the other issues that we should be talking about with our employer has been sort of clouded by other issues. So issues about things like learning technology, um, how it's functioned and how it works is caught up in these other dimensions. And I mean, the, 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 the last and utterly incalculable step is uh, um, who's decided not to come. Um, here, um, you know, as, as students that, that choose not to come, students that look to other institutions as places to go, and faculty members that look elsewhere to go. Those can be very long-term damages that, that, that are very difficult to discern. Um, um, and, and, you know, um, it can be a joy of a year to have a particular student that, that really responds to certain teaching and, and grows um, in, in, in learning a certain subject, and who knows how many we've missed. Mr. Gerard. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for uh, the presentation and the discussion. Uh, perhaps you can help us, because clearly there's a long way back, what other steps need to be taken to get the University of Manitoba back on track from your perspective? And, and also, since you're a history professor, whether there's any historical parallels where uh, universities have suffered great damage like this as a result of um, you know, uh, poor approaches by government to dealing with uh, faculty members. Mr. Thompson. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for the question. I, I don't want to um, speak to professional knowledge beyond what I've got, but yes, universities, the relationship between universities and, and uh, governments is 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 complicated. It it, um, it sometimes universities benefit tremendously from actions of governments, including uh, wrongheaded and um, you know the the, um, the perhaps the greatest gift to a, a single university culture was Nazi Germany driving a bunch of talented scholars away. But of course, that's not on this level. This is a subtle shift and and subtle changes in 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 morale. Um, and and so are there. Are there 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 uh, is there a great parallel that comes to mind? No, I, I'm I'm not sure which is that uh, a, a perfect parallel. What was the other part of your question? If you could remind me, Mr. Gerard. Yeah, the, the other part was uh, what measures need to be taken to uh, Mr. restore. Mr. Gerard, Mr. Gerard, sorry to interrupt you. We've run out of time, so I'm just wondering if there a leave for Mr. Gerard to finish his question, and then we can hear the answer. Is there a leave? Leave has been granted. Go ahead, Mr. Gerard. I, just, I mean, you have a good perspective of what's happening at the university. And, you know, repealing this bill is not enough. What other steps have to be taken as well uh, to get uh, things back on track at the university? Mr. Thompson. Thank you. And I'm sorry for stepping over. Um, I, I suspect there's some work that's already been done. Um, there's an, a start of engagement between members of the faculty and members of the administration. Um, uh, clarity about what budgets are so people can make decisions in, in over the long term and that those decisions are a little bit to the side of, of you know, what are we going to have next year so we can begin to plan and make priorities that, that um, uh, reflect the, the, the views of, uh, you know, the, the Senate of, of what needs to be taught and what's quality teaching. Um, a commitment to education and, and, you know, clarity about the funding of the system so we know how many students will have and what their preparation will be um, when they come to the university. And, and so we can do as, as good a job as we can when they reach that university level. In ways, we have these steps. We have the remedies. The, the, the strike has made up some of the damages and, and the arbitrator's award has made up some of the damages of these um, last years. So maybe we're at a, a point when relationship between uh, management and and you know the the members of umfa will begin to heal a little bit uh but now there's all these lagging structural issues and um of course things like the pandemic that 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 are new you know not just to me but uh and to the university of manitoba to, but to higher education around the world um and and 
part of that is going to be a real challenge making up for the the, the loss in quality of education over the last two years. Uh, but some probably there's also advantages and new techniques that we'll see and have to evaluate, um, hopefully on a, a basis of confidence that we're, you know, dealing with a well-funded institution that has people that, you know, can take the time to deal with students as, as people and bring them along. Professor so Thompson, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we'll next move on to uh, Mr. Mike Howden. Mr. Howden, if you're on camera, just turn your camera on when you're ready to proceed. So Mr. Howden is not on the call, so we'll drop him to the bottom of the list and we'll call on uh, Ms. Gina McKay from QP Manitoba. Uh, Ms. McKay, if you're on, please turn on your camera. Ms. McKay, thank you for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Good evening, Chairperson and Committee members. My name is Gina McKay and I'm the President and National Regional Vice President for the Canadian Union of Public Employees in Manitoba. I'm joining you this evening from Winnipeg, Manitoba on Treaty 1 territory today. I would like to thank the Standing Committee for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening on Bill 2. To give some context, QP Manitoba represents approximately 37,000 public and private sector workers across Manitoba. Our members work in healthcare, education, post-secondary education, public utilities, social services, childcare, municipalities, and more. The Manitoba government's introduction of Bill 28, colloquially known as the Wage Freeze Bill, threw labor relations in this province into chaos. Thousands of Manitoba workers suffered for years, including before the pandemic, because this government's interference in free collective bargaining, as we've heard this evening. Worse yet, these workers have gone years without fair wage increases, including through the pandemic, working under the shadow of the Public Services Sustainability Act, which continues to impact Manitoba workers' lives. The government's goal was to devalue Manitoba workers' wages and livelihoods, forcing them to work for less. The backwards piece of legislation has hurt people and CUPE will not let this government get away with causing this much pain for so long. To this day, public sector bargaining tables continue to offer 0% wage increases due to the legacy of the Public Services Sustainability Act. Some employers refusing to tell us where the mandate is coming from, citing some omni omnius uh, specter that is directing them to continue offering zeros, sometimes without explanation. Uh, while this PSSA is set to be repealed, the damage it has done continues to affect negotiations in all sectors of work in this pro province, as we've heard this evening. 17,000 QP healthcare support workers currently have a strike mandate. This was due in part to the government's goal to freeze wages, along with other harmful pieces of legislation that did pass, like the Healthcare Sector Bargaining Unit Review Act, uh, which threw healthcare into chaos. Other bargaining tables, including school divisions, claimed that they were offering zeros because of the mandate. QP fought back at the bargaining table in dozens of school divisions, and we did not accept zeros at all. We pushed these employers to understand that the zeros were not legislated and that school support staff deserved better, especially during a pandemic. QP members had to take strike mandates in order to break this government's ghost mandate, disrupting their work their lives and impacting the love for the work that they do. Some of the K-12 school members even went on strike for over 60 days during the coldest of months in Manitoba. Yet after all of this time, the government finally decides to withdraw the Public Services Sustainability Act. Some workplaces already accepted these zeros, and we've heard that tonight, even though the workers deserve so much more. The past few years have shown the real human impact of a government that interferes with free collective bargaining. 
low wages and sub-inflationary wage increases also disproportionately impact women, gender diverse workers, indigenous peoples, and workers of color who make up a large part of our membership and also frontline workers. This is why we also believe that in addition to repealing the Public Services Sustainability Act, the government should also withdraw its opposition to the Partnership to Defend Public Services application to have the Supreme Court consider the constitutionality of the wage freeze legislation. And I know we've heard that echoed here tonight quite strongly. We're urging the government to make clear to every public sector employee across all types of work, including healthcare, including school divisions, crown corps, social services, and more, that the provincial government will not interfere with collective bargaining going forward. We believe the Public Services Sustainability Act should never have been introduced. We know the impact that this legislation continues today and how it uh, continues today. It must be withdrawn and this government must be held accountable for the damage it has done to all working Manitobans, whether unionized or non-unionized. Thank you so much. We thank you for your presentation. The floor is now open for questions. Minister Helwer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Some very interesting insights uh, that uh, I've taken note of and uh, appreciate uh, the work that your members have done during the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, we obviously couldn't have made it through without them. We're still making our way along and uh, they've been a, a big part of that. Thank you. Ms. McKay. Thank you, Minister Helwer. Yeah, I'm hoping really what gets reiterated here is that we what we have in common is that we want public service workers to stay in Manitoba, right? We want them to thrive as Manitobans instead of looking to neighboring provinces and changes of careers to make ends meet. So thanks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Weeb. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gina, uh, good to see you again. And uh, thank you so much for the presentation, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here tonight to uh, inform the uh, the committee uh, a little bit of, a, of the perspective of your members. And once again, I feel like the presentation that you've given has been uh, a good cross-section of Manitobans and a good cross-section of those folks that, um, you know, we all called uh, frontline heroes and, and uh, thanks, you know, our frontline workers. And we've certainly heard those sen sentiments and in fact, just from the minister now. Um, I guess my concern is, is that, you know, those are words and, and uh, what we've seen in, in fact is action that, uh, you know, betrays this government's true uh, motivations when it comes to, uh, to working people. So uh, I guess, you know, again, you know, the minister is saying, you know, uh, you know, thank you to the, the frontline workers and, and, and he wants us all to just move on. Uh, do you think Manitoban workers are ready to move on under this government with uh, the same sort of rhetoric coming from this minister again tonight? Ms. McKay? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, are workers ready to move on? You know, how do you move on when you have deep seated zeros in those contracts, right? Uh, so one, I think it's hard, um, uh, hard to recognize that piece because, you know, we need the concrete action. You know, workers in Manitoba are still tabling zeros or receiving zeros at the table. Um, and we see 17,000 healthcare support workers five years without a contract. Some of those workers not even having um, pandemic pay. Right. We have people retent. We're looking at retention. We're looking at, uh, um, you know, we're looking at public service workers uh, moving away from their jobs. Are they ready to move forward? You know, it's hard to it's hard to move forward, especially when you think the impact of five years without an increase. I was doing some math earlier while I was listening along, thinking, you know, for a thirteen dollar or fourteen dollar an hour wage job, it would take you almost 50 percent or 60 percent of your day just to fill the gas tank uh, today on uh, May 16th. Those impacts for workers. How do you move forward? You either look at uh, getting second jobs, sometimes out of the 
sector or changing careers. So I think, um, you know, what we're seeing here is that um, without those deep seated um, changes made and um, uh, statements made and, and language backing up the fact that there won't be interference in the future, these are the things that are important, right? We need to actually look at how can we correct things um, and then how do we look at the deep reaching um, that this uh, wage freeze bill has really created not just in public sector, but also in the community sector that's really seeing the impact um, uh, of Manitobans, right? Accessing community services more than ever and also seeing those zeros tabled uh, in the community sector as well. Mr. Gerard? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. Over the last year, we've seen a big loss of people from Manitoba, of Manitobans who moved elsewhere uh, and fewer Manitobans coming here. Uh, do you think that the uh, Public Sector Sustainability Act and the chaos that happened in labor relations contributed to people moving away from Manitoba? And, and how do we how reverse that? Is just repealing this enough? We, I would think we've got to do more. Ms. McKay? Yeah, excellent point. Absolutely. Uh, workers are leaving, right? Retention, uh, we're seeing uh, not only retention in those uh, sector jobs, but also in the schools, in the education system that's training those workers. I met with the Southern Health Region not too long ago, and those support workers were saying, we one, we can't fill shifts. Two, we have unbelievable vacancy. Three, our wages haven't increased in five years, and we can't even get people to come in to, to do the training. Right, so we're really recognizing, uh, John, that uh, workers are looking elsewhere, that they're adding second and third jobs, um, and that doesn't make for a sustainable future. Ms. McKay, thank you very much. We've run out of time. We thank you for your presentation and for your, your questions and answer period. So we'll move on now to presentations on bill number eight. And uh, Ms. Susan Dawes, the Provincial Judges Association of Manitoba. Ms. Dawes, thank you for joining us this morning. We do have your presentation, so please proceed. Good evening. I'm a legal counsel for the Provincial Judges Association of Manitoba, or PJAM, as I'll refer to it. I provided a presentation brief, which you now have. Um, PJAM represents all 41 full-time provincial court judges, including the chief judge and the associate chief judges. It also represents uh, 14 senior judges as well. On behalf of PJAM, I'll address two aspects of Bill 8, the amendments to judicial education and the judicial appointment process. So first to judicial education. In considering these amendments, the legislature must consider the need to uphold judicial independence and in particular, that the executive and legislative branches of government must respect the independence of the judicial branch of government. As the um, Judicial Council has put it, training sessions provided to government must serve the interests of justice alone and not that of external forces, governmental or otherwise. So control over judicial education is a necessary component of, judi pardon me, of judicial independence and must therefore rest with the judiciary. Uh, current, um, Judicial education is planned and implemented under the direction of the chief judge and an education committee made up of judges of the court. Current judicial education is robust and already entails education on matters related to sexual assault law and social context. Judges currently receive at least 10 days of judicial education per year and the provincial court has a core education program delivered through two annual multi-day education sessions. 
individual judges build their own education plans. They access high quality education through numerous national and international associations, including the National Judicial Institute and the Canadian Association of Provincial Court Judges, and both provide wide range of educational offerings, including programs about the law on sexual assault and social context. The proposed new section 8.1.1 sub 1 is worded permissively in that it says the chief judge may establish seminars for the continuing education of judges, including seminars on matters related to sexual assault law and social context. I note that because this legislative provision could be misconstrued as a direction by the legislature to prescribe specific judicial education uh, educational content, rather, for judges. If so, the legislature could be seen as attempting to influence the specific topics to which judges should pay particular attention and thereby their thinking. That would be a violation of judicial independence. Additional education for judges also has financial and judicial resource implications. Adequate, judicial, uh, adequate funding for judicial education is essential for public confidence in the administration of justice. While the federal government, for example, fully funds judicial education for federally appointed judges, the Provincial Court of Manitoba does not have guaranteed funding for its education. And I address the two types of funding that are received in the presentation brief. Funding for the education contemplated by Bill 8 would come from the court's core education budget, and that particular budget amount of 40000 per annum has remained the same since 2005. The impact of inflation alone, not to mention the increased complexity of matters dealt with by the court, have meant that this budget is no longer adequate to meet the court's needs. Simply put, the public interest demands that all judicial education be fully funded, including that contemplated by Bill 8. Additional education would also impact judicial resources. And if judges are to be taken out of court for more education days, consideration must be given to the judicial complement. And only um, an adequate judicial complement will ensure the timely administration of justice. I'll turn now to the amendments to the judicial appointment process. PGM has asked me to highlight the history and strengths of the current process to assist with your consideration of the amendments set out in Bill 8. One key benefit of the existing process is that it clearly separates the responsibility of the Judicial Appointment Committee from the responsibility of government. Currently, a confidential process is led by an independent committee, which includes members appointed by government. And the work of the committee is depoliticized in that, it, that the needs of the bench and the views of the profession are considered, along with the views of government, in deciding on a short list of candidates to share with the minister. The current process was established in 1989 and 90 following independent research and recommendations by Manitoba's Law Reform Commission. And the Minister of Justice, Mr. James McRae, consulted and collaborated extensively with the Chief Judge, as well as with two judges of the court, in crafting what is now the current process. Minister McRae explained that the objective of the amendments at the time was to enhance the independence of provincial judges by taking their nomination out of political hands. The minister made specific reference to the composition of the appointment committee in his comments to the legislature, where he said, as members can see, government does not have a majority on this committee, so there can be no question of the government stacking the committee to get persons it wants appointed approved without thorough inquiry and scrutiny. Minister McRae also emphasized that the independent process would improve public confidence in the administration of justice. The result was a process which has served the court and the public well by ensuring that the government chooses the most highly qualified candidates for appointment. Now, a number of key features of the existing process would be changed by Bill 8. With the Bill 8 amendments, non-government appointees would no longer form a majority of the committee. This change could create 
a public perception of politicization of the Judicial Appointment Committee um, and of the identification of candidates to be considered for appointment. Further, the removal of the chief judge as chair of the Judicial Appointment Committee and the requirement that a non-judge chair the committee would weaken the JAC's independence from government. Regarding the candidates provided to the minister by the committee, um, the current rigorous independent process for selecting candidates for judicial appointment enhances public confidence in the candidates ultimately selected for judicial appointments. And the short list currently prepared by the JAC limits the potential for politicization of the appointment process. Requiring the committee to provide the minister a list of all current candidates who meet the baseline qualifications for appointment, whether recommended or not, diminishes the role of the JAC in the judicial selection process. It would also provide the government with access to what are now the JAC's confidential considerations concerning uh, candidates who are not recommended. And it would also significantly expand the options available to government uh, for judicial appointments. The changes reduce the separation of the JAC's work from the government's consideration and thereby risk undermining public confidence in the appointment of judges. The current process does not provide for any reevaluation of the JAC's assessment of a candidate. Under Bill 8, the minister may request the reevaluation if the minister disagrees with the JAC's evaluation of the candidate. The reevaluation process allows the minister to second guess the JAC's first hand evaluation of candidates without any apparent rationale. This creates a potential for real or perceived political interference. The presentation brief I provided includes a chart which compares the provinces and territories in respect of four criteria. Does the chief judge chair the committee? Is a majority of the committee non-government? Does the committee recommend a short list? Is government precluded from requesting a reevaluation of the candidates? Manitoba's current process satisfies all four of these indicia of independence, whereas the process resulting from the proposed amendments will satisfy none. I won't take you through each of the other provinces and territories. The situation varies. I will say that if these amendments are passed, Manitoba's process would be in line only with Nova Scotia, where amendments were passed recently and were met with public criticism. So the chart is there for your information to illustrate the high standards of independence and depoliticization achieved by Manitoba's current process and the changes that the amendments would bring. So on behalf of PJAM, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this evening. Thank you very much for your presentation. The floor is now open for questions. Minister Gertsen. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Dawes, for your representation on behalf of the Provincial Court judges. On the two issues you raise, I, I, I'm mindful and I, I support your position in terms of permissive language as it relates to um, sexual assault education and the independence of, of judges. And I know this was a very, you know, uh, live issue. Uh, both in Parliament and in Manitoba. And I think that both sort of landed in the same place in trying to ensure um, that this important education uh, was happening, but also recognizing the independence of, of judges and their education. So I, I think that we've landed uh, in the right place and I appreciate you uh, restating the position of the provincial judges, recognize that that funding for education is always an issue. Today, we we tabled the uh, judicial compensation uh, committee that Mr. Warrior uh, headed up, uh, which touches somewhat on on um, these matters, but not entirely. I know. Uh, and then on the issue of judicial appointments, you know, I recognize this is always a challenge, and federal government made changes a few years ago um, that are are closely or are more aligned with this. Particular proposal, 
Um, and, and there was criticism and comments about that as well. I, I think it's it's uh, done okay in terms of the uh, approval process or the appointment process for judges uh, since the federal government made their changes. There will always be criticisms, I think, no matter what the system is. Um, appreciate you raising Mr. McRae's uh, comments. I think, ironically, he was appointed as a, as a judge, a citizenship judge, it's different, um, but uh, uh, later on. But I have a lot of respect for Mr. McRae, and, and, and I, I appreciate the comments that you bring and i know you bring them with the right um on behalf of the judges with all the right in, uh, intention and uh, hopefully this system uh, i think will uh, be aligned with the federal system which is proven to um, I, I think largely be accepted um but i i'm, I'm mindful of your comments and uh, have taken note of them miss does uh, thank you for that, uh, Minister Gertz, and um, certainly I was pleased to hear today that the Judicial Compensation Committee report had been tabled, and um, BJAM, of course, looks forward to a timely consideration of that report and a response from the, the legislature to it. Um, uh, certainly, th there um, is a recommendation in there for an increase in education allowance. As I said, however, the, the uh, funding for the education that, that is um, in respect of Bill 8 would come from the court's core budget and remains a concern uh, for PGEM. On the other point that you raised about the federal changes um, to the appointment process and, and Manitoba aligning with those, I, I would say this. It's very difficult to sort of quantify or to qualify the, the uh, appointment process for the judiciary and and um, I, I take your comment, Minister Gertzen, that you know it's it appears to have done okay in the federal system. The question is always, how can we ensure we have the highest quality candidates coming forward, um, and and how how do we promote that? We promote that through the most um, independent, the most depoliticized process, in in our um, respectful view. Um, so thank you for your comments and the answer to the, the opportunity to answer that. Yeah. Ms. Fontaine. Miigwech for your presentation this evening. Uh, you know, I, I have uh, a lot of concern in respect of the changes in Bill 8 in respect of the Judicial Appointment Committee. We know that, uh, I guess, in the last year and a bit, uh, there was uh, an appointment process -y and names were given to the former Minister of Justice who didn't do anything with those names and kind of sat on that. Uh, and then this bill came forward and they made changes to the Judiciary uh, Judicial Appointment Committee. I actually think that it's stacking this committee. It's stacking this committee, whether or not the Minister uh, agrees with this, and I know that he's saying that there's changes that occurred federally. It's stacking the committee when you have uh, more not you have more um, uh, folks that are what was the wording in here I just want to make sure the number of committee members who are not lawyers or judges in, is increased from three members to four members and then with the removal of the chief judge to me that uh, that's not good I think that's stacking that and that's an opportunity for the government to put in folks that they would like to see that are maybe particularly more aligned with their ideology. ideology. I think that is incredibly um, scary, uh, particularly when we see what's going on in the states with Roe v. Wade, when we know that Trump uh, put at every single level judges that fit his order, ideology. Order. I think it's incredibly- Sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh but we, we have run out of time, and I would like to give the uh, presenter an opportunity to provide comments. Um, is there leave for the presenter to provide com closing comments on her presentation? Leave is granted. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Doss. Thank you. Uh, PJAM would not propose to get into the politics of the, um, of the issue, as um, um, Ms. Fontaine has done uh, here, but um, certainly I reiterate that the view of the association is very much that the current process has a lot of strengths, has been a, a gold standard um, across Canada, and uh, that that should inform the, the consideration of the bill. So thank you very much and good evening. And we, and we thank you for your presentation this evening. So we'll move on to uh, Mr. Ian Scarth from the Manitoba Bar Association. Mr. Scarth, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good evening, committee, and good evening, chair. <clears throat> My name is Ian Scarth. 
My pronouns are he and him, and I'm the president of the Manitoba Bar Association, an honor to be here this evening on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation. The MBA is the Manitoba branch of the Canadian Bar Association and the voice of the legal profession in Canada. Here in Manitoba, we have approximately 1,650 members consisting of lawyers, legal academics, law students, and members of the judiciary. We're distinct from the Law Society of Manitoba, which is the regulatory body of the profession. The Bar Association not only advocates for the interests of its members, it also advocates for core, certain core principles, one of those being the rule of law, which also requires the independent judiciary free from any influence from other branches of government, including the executive and the legislature. The Manitoba Bar Association enjoys a relationship with all of government representatives in consultation over legislative amendments, whether it's their party or another party, to determine what is the best for the law. And that's where I attend before you today. An independent judiciary is fundamental to maintaining public confidence in the judicial system. And I'm here to address Bill 8 and the impact it will have on the independence of the judiciary and the public conference and the confidence in the administration of justice. Two specific concerns I intend to address. One, the amendments respecting the judicial appointment process, and two, the amendments concerning judicial education. And I intend to spend more on the first topic, as my friend has so eloquently addressed the second. The judicial appointment process, the legislative changes that were introduced to the House were introduced on the basis that they had a couple of changes and effects. One, they were to enhance the accountability of the appointment committee Two, they were to better inform the minister's selection of appointees while retaining confidentiality. And three, the composition of the committee will ensure a balance. No explanation was provided beyond this and no consultation with the stakeholders of the committee. And that includes the Law Society of Manitoba, the Manitoba Bar Association. It also includes the chief judge or the judges of the court. As the president of the Manitoba Bar Association, I've had the distinct honor of serving on the Judicial Appointment Committee and can advise that, that the committee in its current form is highly effective, accountable, and balanced. The current process was established following recommendations of Manitoba's Law Reform Commission and extensive consultations between the government, the chief judge, and two judges of the court. The result, a judicial appointment process which separated the responsibility of the committee from the government and limited the influence that the government could have on judicial appointments. With the exception of two senior judges appointed in 1988, all of our current provincial court judges have been selected under the current legislation. Most recently, a provincial judge in Thompson, Manitoba was appointed under this process, notwithstanding the amendments before the House. The provincial court has a roster of highly quali qualified judges who serve the Manitoba population on a daily basis. It is known as a court of excellence due to the appointment of highly qualified and diverse set of candidates. The amendments proposed by Bill 8 will disrupt the current selection process that has served Manitoba well for almost 35 years and have the effect of politicizing the selection process. The first change in the first amendment relates to the chief judge being removed as the chair. In the current process, the chief judge is responsible for organizing the committee carrying out vital administrative functions. Although the chief judge is responsible for the administrative side, no one voice on the committee carries any more weight, and this includes the chief judge, it's all one vote. Each member of the committee is afforded the opportunity to provide input, and only after a thorough review of the application package and a discussion would a, a selection take place. <clears throat> Removing the chief judge and precluding another judge from acting as chair will place the obligation on another member of the committee, whether the president of the Law Society, the president of the Manitoba Bar Association, or a layperson, to fulfill that administrative role on this committee. This will simply not be possible, as no administrative infrastructure exists and could create a multitude of issue issues relating to the proper governance of the committee, delays, and breach of the strict confidence that the committee holds in interviewing all of its, the people who apply. In other jurisdictions where the chief judge is not the chair, an administrative structure is arranged to manage and deal with the collection of information and arranging of meetings. It's not the case in Manitoba, that infrastructure doesn't exist. Currently, the chief judge is responsible for that. Removing the chief judge from that role takes away that security of that process. 
In addition to administrative difficulties, the diminished role of the chief judge on the committee weakens the committee's independence from government, especially considering that the minister may now call for reevaluations. And I encourage you, and I know you have, to read that legislation carefully, where it says that the minister may call for reevaluation, but then says the committee must. Now you have a minister who's potentially calling the president of the Law Society, president of the Mantle Bar Association, or a lay person and requesting that reevaluation. I just ask you to consider whether or not in the circumstances that that will overstep the bounds of the judicial independence. The composition of the JAC, one of the proposed amendments is to add a fourth person. And the concern of a fourth person is that now we have an imbalance. Whereas before there were two judges, the president of the bar and the president of the, um, uh, the law society, you, and then you had three lay people to balance it out. The majority of non-government appointees, now you have a balance with four government appointees coming forward to speak to this committee. That allows the government to place four people through order and counsel on this committee to provide perspective as to what and who should be appointed. Now the values and, and the insight brought by the lay people is invaluable to the committee. They bring a fresh view that's not from anybody who would know these people and they review the applications on that basis and again their comments are invaluable but the government's appointees cannot be seen to unbalance the other control mechanisms that's been built within this legislation that again has existed for 35 years. So a fourth person can have the effect of diminishing the public perception and that the committee is no longer independent from government interference. And I say this with all due respect to this being proposed forward, but the question is why after 35 years has this now been proposed when we have also have other appointments coming through. Increasing the number of candidates provided to the minister also has a number of concerns. Some have been outlined by my friend, but the previous process after the interviews, selection, vetting, reviewing applications, interviewing everyone, three to six candidates were put forward to the minister for selection and the minister then had the opportunity to review that list and choose from those candidates to select an appointment. Now all candidates who apply must be put to the minister so that the minister can evaluate whether or not anybody else should be given reconsideration. We say that that's just too invasive of the government to have their hands into a committee appointing judges and it erodes the necessary judicial independence. The, I've already spoken about it, but the minister's ability to request a re-evaluation of a candidate effectively allows the minister to second guess the committee's decision on all the work that they've done. That is reviewing the applications, interviewing the candidates and having thorough discussions that involve, again, all of the people who are currently on the committee. There's also concerns over lack of consultation. One question that means to be addressed, given how this legislation originally came in, is why wasn't the MBA, the Law Reform Commission, the Law Society, or the Provincial Court consulted about the changes in advance of, of, of obtaining, and, excuse me, in advance to obtain their perspectives about the operation of the committee? I don't have an answer. The MBA wasn't consulted. If we were consulted in advance, our response would have been that the system has proven to be strong. Show me a candidate who hasn't been strong. Show me a concern with this. Show me a concern that has come forward. We'll address it. We also represent 1,650 members and no concerns were brought before our members that is requiring changes to the provincial court uh, nominating process. As the voice of the profession, we would have been alerted to the concerns and we would have raised those directly with the minister or the justice critic or any other members who would uh, we be able to speak to. Yet Bill 8, without consult consultation, proposes changes that will have the effect of increasing the political influence, undermining public trust in judicial appointments. I'll make some very brief comments because I know I'm running out of time. I spent most of my time on the first issue, as I said. The concern over the mandatory education is the government inserting itself into the, the, the judiciary and putting too much emphasis and creating a window uh, into governing what judges do. Currently, our judicial education is planned and implemented under the, judge, the direction of the Chief Judge and Education Committee. They already receive education on matters related to sexual assault and social contacts. Any legislative influence over judicial education raises concerns as the effect can impact the public perception of judicial independence. To impose requirements erodes the separation of powers and impacts the public confidence. I'm happy to address any questions as my time runs out.
We thank Mr. Scarf. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, Minister Gertsen. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scarth, for your presentation. I know I've only been in this role um, briefly, but I've appreciated our interactions uh, that we've had in this relatively short period of time. Um, just why I had the chance, the previous uh, presenter uh, mentioned a comment that I indicated the federal system was going okay. And of course, what I meant by that uh, wasn't that uh, well, it was just okay in terms of the process, but in terms of the, uh, the feeling that it was independent, I think people feel that it's still quite independent on the federal side. So that was really my comment there, that in the, from a political perspective, that the feeling is that the Liberal government uh, and previous governments, that it's it's gone well. Um, to your comments in particular, uh, I think the challenge sometimes, Mr. Scarth, here is that, you know, there's often a feeling that because you know, folks are appointed to a particular committee by the government, they somehow must then be uh, simply acting at the will or have a connection to the government. That's not always proven to be true. You know, I can give you some pretty dramatic and recent examples, uh, even within our own government, where appointees had very different views uh, from the government. And I don't think that that's unusual, actually, in many governments. I, I want to sort of disabuse maybe that that idea that those who are appointed by the government always have a view and those who are not uh, appointed by the government of course go in with no views and are completely Im impartial and, and that is because it 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 still is the is the requirement of the government to appoint good people into positions that they're qualified for and that will act responsibly and, and regardless of the composition that that is still um, you know, a fundamental factor in all of these things. And I think particularly true when it comes to this particular committee. So um, I take that role seriously. And the people that get appointed to those positions, I take it very seriously. And my expectation is that anybody who would be a successor in my role would do the same. And, and so I, I take your cautions and appreciate you bringing them to the committee tonight. Mr. Skirth. Thank you, Minister Gerson. Um, my comment on the federal versus the Manitoba process is the federal process appropriate for Manitoba. And the consideration of that is effectively the minister and receiving all of the nominations that the minister receives from across Canada. It's a blanket process. The table of concordance that was given out by my friend suggests that provinces are different. They have to be tailored to the province for that appointment process. And Manitoba is distinct and we like to make sure that our judges not only represent our distinct population, and for that purpose, we need the Judicial Appointment Committee to stay the way it is. In relation to anybody appointed, the, it's, it's the potential there that four people can be placed, whereas before it was three. And I just don't understand, and I'm not expecting it to be answered, but the, the reason to increase it to four people and the rationale behind that in terms of how it's supposed to balance a judicial nominating committee with eight people instead of seven. Thank you. Ms. Fontaine. Miigwech for your presentation this evening. Again, I think, you know, the material point to, to this bill is, like, nobody in 35 years, nobody asked for the Judicial Committee appointment or the Judicial Appointment Committee to be changed. It works good. The public has faith in it. It's operated in a good way, in an equitable way. Nobody asked for these changes. And so I think that that's really important to note. And then, you know, I know that the, the minister is, you know, trying to kind of infer that, you know, if they appoint an extra person, so now it's stacked, that, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that that person kind of leans towards conservative views or whatever they, they, they might. But I, I, I want to disabuse him of that. He, I'm going to say that, you know, whoever the uh, PC government appoints to this Judicial Appointment Committee will somehow be in line with what, their, what, what the government feels are its priorities. And, you know, sorry, I know that the minister is saying, like, just trust us. It's going to be okay. Just trust us. We're going to appoint somebody who's unbiased, who doesn't have their own opinions. We know in the real world that, that, doesn't, that that's not accurate. That's not right. Uh, and so, again, I, I just want to put out there, nobody asked for these changes. Nobody. Miigwech. Mr. Scarth. Thank you for your comments. It, it, brief reply with the time I have left. If changes were necessary, the, the Judicial Nominating Committee should have been approached. Uh, the Manitoba Bar Association or any of the stakeholders should have been approached for consultations so that we could have seen the, the overall reaction or 
any sort of concerns that were being raised as to why this needs to be changed or why these amendments need to be changed. And that consultation didn't happen, which is why we're asking you, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak, to have that consideration in your debates. Thank and we you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Next, we'll move on to uh, the Criminal Defense Lawyers Association of Manitoba and Ms. Lisa Labossier. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Ms. Labossier, the, the podium is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair, and good evening, Committee. Again, my name is Lisa Labossier, and I'm on the executive for the Criminal Defense Lawyers Association of Manitoba. For those of you who don't know, we are an organization whose membership is made up exclusively of practicing defense lawyers here in the province of Manitoba. This includes defense lawyers from the private bar, also defense lawyers from Legal Aid Manitoba. I can tell you that uh, we represent individuals, accused people, uh, who are in conflict with the law in all areas of Manitoba including and not limited to Winnipeg, Brandon, Thompson, the Paw, Portage La Prairie, circuits from the various communities uh, and remote, uh, remote rather northern communities as well. Now, the CDLAM seeks to uphold the integrity and independence of criminal defense lawyers as a key stakeholder in our criminal justice system. We work with other stakeholders, including provincial and federal governments, the judiciary and the public to educate and inform about our important role maintaining the rule of law. We also work to safeguard the rights enshrined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and other important aspects of the rule of law, including that all persons, institutions and entities, public and private, are accountable to laws that are equally enforced and independently adjudicated. And it's within that background I make the following presentation. I am here on behalf of the Defense Lawyers Association of Manitoba to express concern with respect to several aspects of Bill 8. Um, I'm going to keep my comments brief. You've already heard uh, two very thorough submissions on these particular issues, but we certainly do have a different perspective um, in that we are defense lawyers and that um, we are, um, it's very important to us to ensure that the system is one that is fair and one that, again, at the end of the day, uh, promotes um, a good justice system. Now first, um, I wanna speak about the amendments to the Provincial Court Act that speak about the appointment process, and that's uh, section 3.3 sub two uh, in Bill 8. And essentially, uh, what that amendment is speaking to is the change in composition of the committee in terms of the numbers uh, of individuals in the committee and also who the chair is. Currently, the committee uh, is apprised of seven members, so it's a seven-member panel. There are three politically appointed members who are non-lawyers, and three lawyers, which you've heard, are from the Law Society of Manitoba, the Manitoba Bar Association, um, and, I can, and also um, you've heard that there is two judges, um, one that is the president of the um, Association of Judges and also the chief who chairs uh, that particular committee. Now, Bill 8 increases the number of politically appointed non-lawyers to four. Um, and um, if I can say, and it's not speaking out of turn, I would respectfully submit on behalf of the CD, CDLAM that Ms. Fontaine and her questions earlier on has really hit the nail on the head with respect to what the concern is there. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, in addition to that, we also have a, a chair who is not no longer the chief judge, which is also concerning. So the effect of this, or the appearance of this, rather, um, with the greatest of respect, um, is really increasing the political nature of the process. What is the other, what is the reason for removing the chief judge as chair? What is the reason for adding another politically appointed member? I respectfully submit on behalf of the CDLAM um, and um, again, perhaps using the words um, stacking the committee uh, may not be words that I should necessarily use, but I don't necessarily think that that is incorrect in terms of how that may appear. I can also indicate that 
the amendments um, allow, the way that they are now, the proposed amendments would allow a non-lawyer to chair this particular committee who would be dealing with highly confidential documents about lawyers who are applying to be a judges of this court. There's very sensitive information about lawyers which are shared, including criminal record checks, law society checks. Um, there are lawyers who are applying in confidence, who are potentially risking their positions within their own firms, um, their positions within the bar. And what will that process look like? How will confidentiality under the new proposed amendments um, be maintained? Um, now that confidentiality is maintained within the chief's office and I understand is um, guarded very carefully. Um, the chief judge is not only a trained lawyer, but the chief of the court um, who certainly um, can maintain and does maintain confidentiality to the highest degree. Um, and with respect to removing the chief as chair, we would also respectfully submit um, that the chief, or at very least a judge, is in the best position to determine the needs of the court. They are in the best position to lead the discussion on the expertise that's required, on what experience would make a good judge. They can provide advice on the skills required and have a lot of experience on the temperament um, that a judge should have. We submit that it's in the interest of the public to have a judicial appointment process where the court is independent from government influence. The amendments in this particular case we submit do the exact opposite. They appear to enhance government influence uh, in the process of appointing judges. And we say that the politicization of this process continues um, with further amendments um, that are before you in Bill 8. The new proposed 3.6 sub 1, those amendments would require the entire list of candidates uh, provided they meet the baseline requirements to be provided to the minister. Currently, the way the system is now that the committee prepares a list of qualified candidates, um, no less than three, no more than six per vacant position, and that is sent over, sent over to the minister's office. In effect, this particular amendment allows the minister to review the entire list, to select from the entire list, rather than the names vetted by the committee. And again, these names vetted by the committee are based on the current needs of the court, um, ensuring that the bench reflects the diverse population of Manitobans. It takes into account um, thorough, as I understand it, uh, are very thorough interviews. Uh, it takes into account judicial uh, independence um, and, as I said before, uh, appropriate judicial temperament. Arguably, the reason for a committee in the first place is to remove the broader selection process away from government, which we say at the end of the day enhances transparency, fairness, and confidence in the justice system. In terms of an additional proposed amendment which compounds the concerns that I've already shared, Section 3.6 sub 2 and 3.6 sub 3, um, in essence, uh, is a request for reevaluation. So in, an, in essence, if the minister disagrees with the committee's evaluation of a candidate, they can request it go back and be uh, reevaluated. To, to what end is that reevaluation? Um, with the greatest of respect, it appears to be just paying lip service to the committee. The committee um, has again come up uh, with names and recommendations based on interviews, checks, discussions, and have recommended um, highly uh, quality candidates. Um, and in some cases, they may not be recommending certain candidates for very valid reasons. This particular re-evaluation could appear to be a signal to the committee that the government wants this person to be appointed. Again, this is not consistent with transparency nor an independent process, and we say that it weakens the public's confidence in the administration of justice. We say that 
This proposed process is a process, again, with the greatest of respect, that is deeply influenced by government and politics, whoever that government might be. In essence, again, these uh, changes or proposed changes we respectfully submit devalue the important work that the committee does and is essentially, um, and perhaps this is using strong language, but essentially um, stripping the committee uh, uh, from true selection power. So in conclusion, I would ask that you consider the comments made and make a decision consistent with enhancing the rule of law and enhancing the public's confidence in the administration of justice. And we submit this proposed bill does the exact opposite. So thank you very much um, for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Minister Gertsen. Thank you, Ms. Labasse, for your uh, presentation and your work with CDLM. Um, you know, one of the reasons why the federal government went to a new process was they believed that they wanted to make sure the court was reflective and they thought having a broader list to select from would, would do that, which is sort of the counter argument that you're making um, here. So I think sometimes your argument is getting used both ways. Uh, I have heard from those in the defense bar um, who have said it's important to make sure that there are a number of um, defense lawyers, those with that background, being appointed to the judiciary because they bring sort of administrative skills. I, I, I understand that argument and I agree with uh, the rationale uh, for it. I think we appointed a, a most recently a defense bar uh, lawyer in uh, in Thompson, so I understand that. I, I, I get your point on confidentiality. I've, I've made note of that, and we'll take that back. On the issue of board composition, you know, I, I think part of the challenge is my experience with boards is that where there are subject matter experts on boards, regardless of how many they are compared to lay people on those boards, they have a disproportionate influence, as they probably should, because they're subject matter experts. And so I'm not uh, convinced that, you know, the the chief judge and the lawyers who will be on that um, committee won't continue to have um, more influence than, than, than others because they're subject matter experts. And I think that that's true for for most boards where there are subject matter experts and that's probably as it should be uh and that that, that lay people sort of just bring a different perspective um but but tend perhaps to have less influence as a result of that but but i understand the concerns that you've raised um and taken uh, and taken note of them and again uh only been a short period of time since we've been interacting in, in these particular roles, but I've appreciated your comments in the past and, and took them to heart in terms of the uh, the good work of uh, the defense bar and the importance of having them represented on the judiciary as well. Ms. Labossier? Yes, thank you. Um, just uh, to respond briefly to two comments uh, made by Minister Gertsen. Um, first is res with respect to um, the comment he made about the broader list being provided and how, I'm going to sort of sum up what he said, that that's, could be a good thing and um, is sort of looking at the argument on the other side of the coin. Um, but again, I go back to um, how the government, not having been on the committee, could possibly be in a position to determine who would be uh, the best fit for that particular job, given the needs of the court and everything that the committee already did, including those interviews. Um, and again, just with respect to the comments about adding um, another individual in terms of the uh, political appointment, um, I, I guess all I can say in response is, why there really is no why um, and why is it that the chief is uh, being suggested that the chief be removed as chair like why is that um, and at the end of the day I think that the uh, answer to why is not necessarily something that um, maybe I can say at the end of the day the answer um, is really the appearance that this is tied to politics because there really is no other why with the greatest of respect. Ms. Fontaine. Which for your presentation uh, this evening, I appreciate all of the words that you're putting on the official record uh, for all to see as we kind of move through this process. Um, I, I know the minister keeps talking about like the challenges and the challenges, but again, I, I want to go back to the point that like what challenge? This is a, a this is a chal a challenge that's being made or proposed or kind of you know spun from the government's making. Like again, in 35 years, nobody asked for any changes to the Judicial Appointment Committee, nobody. Absolutely nobody asked for it. 
And so I don't, I don't know when the minister says the challenge is, that, that there is no challenge. The committee's been working fine for 35 years. And so, you know, I think that these changes, again, let me just say, I think are very dangerous. They undermine uh, the, um, D, you know, this is, it, it undermines that this isn't a political then process moving forward here and who the government of the day wants to have in that position. What if you have a government that doesn't actually appreciate defense lawyers? and doesn't appreciate lawyers that fight for you know, those that are in conflict with the law because of drugs or whatever it may be. What if you have a government of the day that doesn't want those folks appointed? That's really dangerous for our judi judiciary. And so again, I thank you for you being here tonight and I appreciate all your expertise. Ms. Labossiere, I know we have very few seconds left, but. Yes, just very uh, briefly in reply, I think the reverse to what Ms. Fontaine also said is true. Um, what if we have a government who wants to appoint only um, you know, bleeding heart individuals who want to release everyone from prison and don't necessarily want people held accountable? That's a very stark example that I'm providing, but the reverse is also true. And again, uh, I'd agree, dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. So our next presenter is on Bill 17, the Family Law Act, the Family Support Enforcement Act, and the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Amendment Act. Uh, Lawrence Pinsky from the Family Arbitration and Mediation Institute. And Mr. Pinsky is online, I believe, so if you could turn your camera on when you're ready. Mr. Pinsky, well, thank you for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Mr. Pinsky, we cannot hear you, so you might be muted. I was muted. Many of my colleagues have long asked for me to be muted, and I did it right there. So thank you. A good evening, Mr. Chair, Mr. Minister, and honorable members. Um, I also would acknowledge that we're gathered on Treaty 1 territory and that Manitoba is located on treaty territories and ancestral lands of Indigenous, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, unlike uh, other presenters this evening on other bills, I come to praise the legislation put forward but also humbly offer a little bit of input with respect to the Family Law Act. I'm here on behalf of FAMLI, F-A-M-L-I, which is the Family Arbitration and Mediation Legal Institute. It's a non-for-profit entity that's of recent vintage. I am one of the founders of it. We have over 30 professionals serving the public, uh, mostly family lawyers, but also some mental health and financial professionals uh, are members as well. Family law in Manitoba has evolved into a layered system of justice. The court, of course, remains present. And as a unified family court in Manitoba, the second in Canada, it remains a specialized uh, service that delivers excellent service overall. But beyond that, there's space for um, uh, mediation and arbitration. And that's what family does. It gives early excellent access to a decider trained in family law. I, I, I pause there to here to note that the social science is very clear that early intervention by a professional, by a decider who's trained in the area is absolutely critical in making sure that families don't who are separated don't continue down a path that is um, less than what would be expected or wanted for children overall for their best interests or for the families themselves. As you can imagine on separation, it's a highly emotive time and permitting people to, uh, without that input, to continue down paths that are less than what one would hope uh, obviously isn't in their interest or in the best interests of children. In family, arbitrators are trained. They have over 10 years experience practicing uh, uh, primarily in family law. They're trained in domestic violence issues such as screening. And by permitting this and then actually enhancing this, and, and I'll mention why I raise this in a moment, it allows for early intervention. It allows for privacy. That is when we have arbitration. It allows for the appointment of a knowledgeable person uh, to deal with whatever the issue happens to be. It permits confidentiality, less formality, and really a bespoke process that consists of fairness, me uh, meeting standards of natural justice, and of course, follows Manitoba and Canadian law. The result is a faster, more efficient uh, delivery of justice. I, I, I pause here to note that the court has evolved into a system now where there's 
all sorts of preliminary requirements before one can see a judge. There are all sorts of opportunities to settle matters, but until one can get before a judge, it can be many, many thousands of dollars and lots of time, time that's wasted where families can continue down a wrong path. And, and that's where really we have this multi-layered system where arbitration and mediation comes in. I should say that I'm honored to speak to you this evening. I'm a former provincial and national chair of the family section of the Manitoba Bar Association, the Canadian Bar Association. I was privileged to advocate with many others for changes to the Divorce Act. I had the honor of being the national chair of the family section when we wrote to the justice uh, minister federally, seeking some of the amendments that became the amended Divorce Act. And I commend the government now for, for this piece of legislation that really advocates consistency between the federal legislation and uh, here in Manitoba. Um, so I should say as well that I commend all of you for working together. I read the Hansard with respect to uh, second uh, reading, and uh, it's consistent, I must say, with all the years that I've been doing this and seeing what uh, all members of all sides have done, both federally and provincially. I worked with the Conservative Minister of Justice at the time to seek changes to relocation provisions. That was Mr. McKay federally, with the Liberal Minister of Justice federally, Mr. Lametti. I worked with the former NDP a, a government uh, ministers, Mr. McIntosh and Mr. Swan. I had consultations with the current minister at the time. I don't know if he would recall that, but I'm happy to say that political considerations in Manitoba, and I think Canada generally, have taken a backseat when it comes to this type of legislation, and that's a positive thing. Uh, it, by coincidence, I happen to be facing south where I'm sitting at the moment, and we are not following what we see down south in terms of family law types of legislation. So that's a good thing. Um, I want to commend the government for <clears throat> including in family dispute of resolution processes, family arbitration, and mediation. Most definitely a positive step and an advance uh, in our jurisdiction. Um, I can tell you um, that I've had requests from members of the bar in other jurisdictions asking me to tell them as soon as this is passed because they want to lobby their provincial uh, governments to copy ours uh, and include uh, the specific mention of arbitration. Uh, it's fair to say that in the Divorce Act, the issue of family arbitration is implied, though not stated, um, though other things are in terms of the requirement on counsel to engage in ADR. Um, I want to commend the government as well for its definition of family violence in the act and the use of terms like coercive control. That's a positive thing. Um, nothing I say here tonight should be taken to suggest that there should be any delay in the passage of this law of this bill, rather. Um, and, but I do suggest that maybe it might be time to take a look at the definition of domestic violence in the Domestic Violence and Stalking Act and consider whether the definition there ought to reflect what we have here. It's more inclusive. It's broader. There is a philosophical argument to say that maybe a JJP um, ought not have as much power to deal with that. I, I don't think that that should carry the day. Uh, but rather in the future, there should be some drive uh, to consistency overall, I would suggest. I would suggest as well that in the definition of marriage like a relationship, again, not to, to imply that there should be any a, a delay in passing this bill, but um, as society moves in the direction it's moving in, um, it's going to require some thought to situations where more than two people are living together in a conjugal a relationship. And uh, this bill only contemplates that. That's not to say that family is advocating for more than two people in a relationship for or against. It's just that as the, as society changes, family law has to change. And this bill in part goes a long way in recognizing that. Another issue that I'd want to bring to all of your attention is the duties on parties. It's Our submission is that um, it ought to comply with and reflect duties in Section 35. That is, that parents should have a duty to promote all of the same best interest factors that are set out in Section 35, including ensuring that the child has as much time with each parent as is consistent with the child's best interest. That's in Section 38. But in 38, it's for judges to consider. My suggestion, if it meets with the pleasure of all parties, but not if it causes any delay at all, 
is to say that there should be an active duty on parents to ensure that very same concept, maximization of time, but only consistent with best interests, not maximizing overall. So I'm just suggesting, family is suggesting that that concept where the court has to look at it should also be a duty on uh, parents, on parties where children uh, are involved. Um, I do note that in second reading, uh, the uh, the and I mean this, the honorable uh, uh, members from St. John's and of River Heights, uh, who I respect a great deal, had suggested that alienation is, is has been uh, debunked or words to that effect. That isn't actually accurate, uh, with all due respect. And, I, and again, I mean that the reality is that it's much more nuanced. There are alignments. There are, in rare cases, alienation that's not justified. Um, I, I, we've seen it anecdotally, we see it in the literature, and to suggest that that's not the case is in fact a problem. Uh, it is the case in, in some cases, it's most often, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's more nuanced than that, where you have some reason, some issue, and some back and forth, but in some cases it's actually present. Many of us practitioners have seen cases like that, some of us have them right now, and uh, that reality exists on a spectrum. So I'm just inviting the, the honorable uh, a minister and uh, the other members to consider if including the duty to maximize time consistent with best interest, but not otherwise, that that be reflected on a parent's duty as well. Um, in terms uh, of the duty on counsel, there's a question in section 91A, it seems to me, or rather an implied concept that there's a requirement for counsel to undertake a form of domestic violence screening. Um, and I can talk about that more later. Um, there may be some thought that's given to actually expressing that directly. Um, Mr. Pinsky, thank you very much. Our time has run out on your presentation. Uh, so I am gonna open the floor up for questions. Uh, Minister Gertsen. Um, I, I wonder if there's a uh, leave for Mr. Uh, Pinsky just to conclude his remarks. He had some helpful suggestions, and I, I think he was probably close to the end. Thank you very much for that, Minister. Is there leave to allow Mr. Pinsky to pr continue with his presentation? Leave has been granted. Mr. Pinsky, please conclude. I thank the Minister and the, and the Honourable Members. Um, I, I would, I'll just conclude quickly to say uh, that um, uh, we offer kudos to the government for proceeding as they have. Um, and I also wanted to point out as well two final points. One is that Family uh, Resolution Services uh, requires some additional help and funding. They've gone through some difficult times in their staffing and other issues. And to get the voice of the child before the court, which is critical, and Canada, of course, is a signatory to the UN Convention, that's uh, terribly important. Finally, on relocation issues, again, we reflect what's in the Divorce Act. And I would just add in that our regulations should be crystal clear because there have been some problems in Canada about this in-person service unless there's a court order saying otherwise. There's one case where the requirement to give notice was uh, dispensed with, at least initially, or suspended, which I could talk about more subsequently. It's an important thing where there's domestic violence, but where there isn't any, there should be personal service so that it's not a situation where one person says, oh, I mailed it and then I left, and the left behind parent is left having to scratch back and the court is left in a terrible position of having to bring a child back. So personal service would be an innovative and positive thing and consistent with the spirit of both the Divorce Act and these amendments, which are all consistent with the best interests of, uh, of the children. So that concludes my initial comments, uh, subject to any questions that you may have. Well, once again, we thank you very much for your presentation and we will open the floor up to questions. Minister Gertsen. Yeah, Mr. Pinsky, thank you again very much. Uh, just so you know, uh, officials of, uh, from the department are, are online and, and taking notes on the suggestions, and I think some of them are very helpful, whether they can be incorporated now or in subsequent amendments, um, and because I know that some of them relate to other bills. Uh, it is it's noted, and, uh, and I think that they'll be followed up on, so thank you for doing that. You, you made the point about early intervention which is true and and i think that we're learning that the earlier we can intervene the better so thank you for uh the work that you and those who you work with do and then finally you know you mentioned i think rightly 
that legislators in Manitoba tend to work together on these bills. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is that family law is a complicated enough area of law that most of us don't quite understand it uh, in a way to be too argumentative. Uh, but secondly, even if we don't understand the substance always um, uh, to the degree that you do as a subject matter expert, we all have the same motivation. We believe that we should be able to reduce conflict and have the best interest of children uh, at play as much as we can. So we're driven by the same motivation, uh, but don't always have the 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 clear knowledge of how to, to gain that those motivations. So, you know, to the extent that you can continue to provide advice in the future on how to fulfill those motivations for us as legislators on all political parties, I think we'll appreciate that. So thank you again. Uh, Mr. Pinsky. A minister and just say my colleagues across Canada used to call it the Manitoba miracle. We have fantastic judges here. We have politicians who listen and there's an excellent staff at the family law branch as well who listen as well. And uh, family, our organization will always be available to try to put Manitoba families first, as all of us are doing, even if the way it's being done is slightly different from time to time. Bill 33 versus this one, for example. Uh, but we're all here to help. And, and I agree with what you said. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Ms. Fontaine. Miigwech for your presentation. I'm not going to take uh, too much time. I just uh, want to revisit uh, parental alienation. I know you're saying that that's uh, in, in fact wrong uh, and it's more nuanced than that. I, I don't disagree that it's more nuanced, but let me just say this. Uh, I think in the 1980s, the American Psychological Association debunked parental alienation. And, and one of the reasons why is because that it's often used by men in custody arrangements who have had uh, a history of being abusive either to their wife or to their children. And then it, it constructs the man, the father, the husband, whatever it may be, as the victim in this case. And that's what parental alienation has been used to do is to divert attention from the abuse of this man and to undermine the woman who was seeking custody. And, uh, and, you know, it's part of this, like, men's right movement, as if men don't have any rights before the courts. I mean, everything is, is for men, by men, uh, in, in all of its capacities. So I, I would disabuse that it hasn't been debunked. It has been debunked. And it's used as a tool against women in the courts. Miigwech. Mr. Pinsky. Yeah, so I thank the member. Um, it's fair enough to say that Dr. Warshak was the one who came up with the theory. And uh, it was used initially quite radically to say in every case, right, where you have an abuser, you have someone, a parent who had nothing to do with their child and then the child or was abusive in some way. And then the child said, I don't want to have anything to do with this person. And that kept being called parental alienation, which was inaccurate. So if that's what the member meant, that is fair and true. If, however, it meant that in all cases, that there's no such thing as parental alienation, that's not correct, um, I say with respect. And the other thing I say as well is, it's unquestionable that most domestic violence occurs against women. There's no question about that. And some groups try to advocate for something else. The social science simply doesn't support that. That doesn't mean that all abuse is men abusing women. In some cases, very much the minority, um, it's women who are abusive to men and abusive to their children, but a minority of cases. So we have to be careful with our language, I would submit to all of you. And it's fair enough to say that uh, we have to be sensitive about parental alienation issues, but not use it as a blanket, as the honorable member mentioned. So thank you for the opportunity to respond. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Mr. Gerard. Okay, we have the opportunity to bring in amendments. If you had a choice in a very few moments, which would be the amendment you would bring in? Okay, I'm just going to ask if we could have leave as we run out of time for uh, Mr. Pinsky to provide an answer. Do we have leave? Leave. Leave is, is granted. Mr. Pinsky, go ahead. Thank you, all of you, uh, for permitting me leave to respond to that. Again, I would hasten to say that please don't postpone passage of the bill. So that's number one. Number two, um, the, 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 if I could do two, uh, and one may be by regulation, service for relocation, 
is absolutely critical. But the most critical, if you're actually amending, is the duty on the parent to facilitate the the uh, the greatest amount of parenting responsibility, but only consistent with the best interest of the child. That would be the top one. I think that the uh, the piece about service of relocation probably can be by regulation, subject to your staff who knows far more about it than I do. But if that can be done by regulation, you don't need an amendment. Uh, but those would be the two. Otherwise, fantastic bill. Well done to all of you for permitting it to go through. Mr. Pinsky, thank you again for joining us this evening and providing your presentation. So we will move back to uh, bill number two, the Public Services Sustainability Repeal Act. Um, our presenter on the list was Bob Morose from the Manitoba Association of Healthcare Professionals. Um, but we have been informed that Mr. Morose is unable to present this evening. Instead, he has made a written submission, which is now being distributed to members. Does the committee agree to have Mr. Moraz's written submission appear in the Hansard transcript of this meeting? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Thank you so much. So now we'll call on Mr. Mike Howden. Is Mr. Mike Howden with us this evening? And he's not on the call. So that will conclude our presentations for this evening. So we will now look at the, uh, the bills before us. What uh, order does the committee wish to proceed with the clause by clause consideration of these bills? Uh, Mr. Gertsen. Um, I believe that it's often been the case in the past and we've had flooding like we do in Manitoba that we do our best to accommodate the minister uh, responsible for, um, for trying to mitigate the flooding because uh, he's got many things to do. And uh, so I would suggest that we do the bills that relate to the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation first, and then uh, following his bills, we can do them in numerical order, starting with the lowest number. So we have before us the uh, idea of presenting uh, the bills by Minister Pinuk with infrastructure and uh, first, and then proceeding to a numerical order after that, which would give us bill 15, 21, then two, eight, and 17. All agreed? Agreed and so ordered. So we will move to bill number 15. Now, does the minister responsible, oops, sorry. Does the minister responsible for bill 15 have an opening statement? Yes, I do, um, Mr. Minister, Chair. Minister Pinuk. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be here tonight to discuss Bill 15, the Drivers and Vehicle Amendment and Highway Traffic Amendment Act. We introduced this bill to, as part of the Manitoba government's commitment to improve service delivery and red, reduce red tape for our citizens. Bill 15 introduced three key changes. The first change relates to the Medical Review Committee, which is an administrative tribunal that hears appeals when a person's driver's license has been suspended, canceled, or refused on med medical grounds. Currently, the Medical Review Committee consists of five members, including at least three medical practitioners. Under the Highway Traffic Act, they must be a neurologist, a cardiologist, a general practitioner, and an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. Each case is heard by a minimum of three members within the appropriate expertise. This bill will remove the medical specialties from the Act. This is indeed because having the specialties in legislative makes a difference in the committee to have enough qualified members to hear appeals in a timely fashion. Instead, we are proposing that qualifications for members be set by policy based on the medical needs of cases. This will be more flexible process that will reduce delays in hearing appeals. And this will be imp important because whether or not the person can drive may have major implications on their individual lifestyle. I would also like to mention that there is no intention to remove the existing medical specialties from the board itself and the policy will reflect that. That intent is to have ability to include other areas where expertise is needed. The second change made by this bill is to allow online reporting of the police when a driver is involved with a certain type of motor vehicle accidents or hit or runs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Manitoba government allowed temporary online police reporting for these incidents, since the police de de uh, detachments were not open to in-person reporting. 
This bill will make these changes permanent and which is lessen the administrative burden on the public and the police. Lastly, the third change made by the bill is to allow the license suspension appeal board to hear appeals from commercial vehicle operators when their safety fitness certificate has been suspended or canceled. Currently, these appeals come from to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Having the License suspend, Suspension Appeal Board hear these appeals makes more sense as the board is independent and has an appropriate expertise to hear these types of appeals. Manitoba Transportation Infrastructure believes that Bill 15 has strong support from stakeholders and the public and will improve the way that citizens interact with government and decrease wait times. As a final comment, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all those who provided input and support for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we thank the minister. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? Mr. Weeb. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to put a few words on the record with regards to uh, Bill 15, the Drivers and Vehicles Amendment and Highway Traffic Amendment Act. This bill amends the Drivers and Vehicles Act and the Highway Traffic Act in three res respects. Through the Highway Traffic Act, medical practitioners report to the Registrar of Motor Vehicles when a person's physical health impedes their ability to drive a vehicle. Within the same legislation exists a provision about the Medical Review Committee, which is now being moved to the Driver and Vehicles Act. Appreciate the words on the record from the Minister with regards to the composition of the committee. We continue to uh, monitor that and uh, appreciate uh, as we go through the legislative process feedback about ways to ensure that that committee has proper composition. Currently an operator can appeal a director's decision about their safety and fitness certificate to the minister, but this bill is changing that process. With amendments proposed in this bill, the appeals will now be heard by the license suspension appeal board. Uh, we continue to uh, ask that the minister ensure that the board has appropriate, appropriate resources as this will impact commercial drivers in the province. Thirdly, we understand this bill continues practices that were set in place during the pandemic, giving Manitobans an op option to submit police reports electronically. We also understand that the government wishes to make permanent provisions around online reporting of minor highway traffic incidents. Used correctly, this me can mean a more convenient way to do this, but we also need to make sure that these changes are as widely accessible as possible, for example, for those with disabilities. The move to online reporting can make it more difficult for folks, especially those with visual, physical, or intellectual disabilities from accessing services and goods that should be made uh, widely available. It is important that the government respects the provisions of the Accessibility for Manitobans Act. I'd like to thank uh, all those who have had input into this bill and uh, appreciate seeing this bill move forward here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we thank the member for those comments. So during the consideration of a bill, the enacting clause and the title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Also, if there is agreement from the committee, the chair will call clauses in blocks that conform to pages with the understanding that we will stop at any particular clause or clauses where members may have comments, questions, or amendments to propose. Is that agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Shall clauses one and two pass? Pass. Pass. Clauses one and two are accordingly passed. Shall clause three pass? Clause three is accordingly passed. Shall clauses four through six pass? Clauses four through six are accordingly passed. Shall clauses seven through 11 pass? Pass. Clauses seven through 11 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 12 through 15 pass? Pass. Clauses 12 through 15 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 16 through 18 pass? Pass. Clauses 16 through 18 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 19 pass? Pass. Clause 19 is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? Pass. The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? Pass. The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Yes. Agreed? The bill shall be reported. So next we move on to Bill 21. Clause by clause. Does the minister responsible for Bill 21 have an opening statement? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Uh, minister, good evening. Uh, minister Panuk, go ahead. 
Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to bring uh, here tonight to hear input from public and uh, back to for bill number 21, the, the Highway Traffic Amendment and the Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation Amendment Act. We introduced this bill to create and authorize shared streets and to allow pilot projects to be established by regulation in re response to a number of requests from municipalities, businesses, and other organizations in Manitoba. Bill 21 paves the way to, for pilot testing of micromobility devices such as electronic kick scooters, low speed vehicles, and personal transportation vehicles on roads. If passed, regula regulations will be developed to set the, out the conditions of the pilot projects. The conditions may include the types of device or vehicle being tested, maximum speed limit, age limit, insurance requirements, and so on. A goal of this bill is to provide more options for active and alternative transportation while ensuring the safety of all road users. Pilot testing will give Manitoba a means of to try out the use of micromobility devices and low speed vehicles on streets before making any permanent legislative changes. Bill 21 also establishes the concept of shared streets in the Tr Highway Traffic Act. A shared street is one where all road users have equal access of the road, but with conditions. For example, the maximum speed limit will be 20 kilometers per hour and regulates, uh, regulated signage um, on streets will be required for public awareness to ensure road safety. Municipalities will be able to make bylaws to designate shared streets where they are seek fit based on the interest of their community. Shared streets have the potential to foster a safe and friendly environment for pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, and people using recreation equipment. Bill 21 represents the exciting opportunity for Manitoba to test our new transportation options and create spaces where all road users can safely coexist. And I look forward to the passage of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chair. And we thank the minister for those comments. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? Mr. Weeb. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Put a few words on the record with regards to uh, Bill 21. Bill 21, as we know, allows for municipalities to designate certain streets as shared streets, giving drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists equal priority. It also allows for traffic-related pilot projects and makes changes related to insurance for the introduction of new forms of transportation like e-scooters. While we recognize that Bill 21 is a step in the right direction, it is in some ways too little too late. The province failed to work with the city of Winnipeg during the worst waves of the pandemic, which forced it to shut down its shared streets program at a time when residents were desperate for outdoor exercise. And concerns have been raised that the 20 kilometer an hour limit Bill 21 sets for shared streets will limit the number of streets that municipalities can designate as shared streets compared with the city of Winnipeg's suggestion that cars on designated open streets be allowed to drive at 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, as I've said many times before, there's a very few positives that have come out of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, people's appreciation for active transportation and uh, outdoor exercise in general um, could, be, uh, could be indicated as one of those positives. And uh, once again, the uh, adversarial position that the government of Manitoba has taken with regards to the city of Winnipeg has resulted us in uh, us now finally seeing Bill 21 come forward uh, rather than at the most opportune time when there was broad political consensus to get something done. Uh, likewise, uh, with regards to personal mobility devices, uh, e-scooters and the like, uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, interest in this uh, from the private sector, from individuals. And so, uh, while again, we applaud the government for finally moving forward on it, we believe that this is, uh, you know, uh, one step behind once again. So uh, we are happy to see it move forward here today. I thank uh, the committee for its consideration here tonight. I look forward to this coming to the House at third reading. And we thank the member for those comments. So during the consideration of a bill, the enacting clause and the title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Also, if there is agreement from the committee, the chair will call clauses in blocks that conform with pages with the understanding that we will stop at any particular clause or clauses where members may have comments, questions,
questions or amendments to propose. Is that agreed? Agreed, sir. Agreed. Shall clauses one and two pass? Pass. Clauses one and two are accordingly passed. Shall clause three pass? Pass. Clause three is accordingly passed. Shall clause four pass? Pass. Clause four is accordingly passed. Shall clauses five through nine pass? Pass. Clauses five through nine are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 10 and 11 pass? Pass. Clauses 10 and 11 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 12 pass? Pass. Clause 12 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 13 pass? Pass. Clause 13 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 14 pass? Pass. Clause 14 is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? The pass. enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? Pass. The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Yes. Agreed. The bill shall be reported. So we'll now proceed with clause by clause of bill number two. Does the minister responsible for bill two have an opening statement? Minister uh, yeah, Chair. Minister Heller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, very brief, like the bill, it is indeed time to move on. The uh, PSSA was passed in 2017, never in force. It was a product of a very different time and different circumstances. We are indeed looking uh, to move forward and build relationships uh, with Labour as we, we do move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We thank the Minister for those comments. Does a critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? Mr. Weeb. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, it's uh, quite disappointing uh, to hear the comments from the minister here tonight, um, especially after we heard from so many presenters who brought forward so many um, touching stories about the impacts that the PSSA and Bill 28 has had on workers in this province. And, you know, what, what I really appreciated about those presentations was that we heard from a wide range of folks. Uh, we heard from organized labor. We heard from folks who represented um, government workers. We heard from folks who represented healthcare workers. We heard from folks who represented the private sector. Uh, we heard from folks who represented other frontline workers in our province. And it's, you know, given that level of um, of information that was shared here today. And, and again, the real impacts that this has had on workers. Um, it's quite disappointing that the minister can't even take, you know, what was that, uh, 20 seconds to lay out uh, his government's position and try, begin to try to convince the workers of Manitoba that somehow he's different, that he's going to be different and that this government has uh, seen the error of its ways has uh, had its road to Damascus moment, and uh, things are going to be completely different now. Uh, and it's a new dawn for um, uh, for relationship with working people in this province. But we know that that's not the case. And no matter how many times the minister wants to say uh, it's time to move on, um, the workers in this province, I don't think, are are quite ready to because they're still feeling the effects. They're still seeing the effects in their current. Um, negotiations that many are still uh, negotiating contracts that were impacted delayed by bill 28 and the impact that that had it's being felt by those workers who are working under contracts that were signed when bill 28 was uh, a, hanging over their heads like the sword of damocles uh, forcing them into uh, unfavorable bargaining positions um, this, uh, th this, the, the, the impact of Bill 28 and the PSSA will be felt on this province for a very long time. And we heard that very clearly from the presenters tonight. And so for the minister to simply say, uh, you know, move on. And, and to, you know, and, and at one point the minister in fact said, it, you know, uh, it takes two to, uh, to move on here and, you know, it two to tango and and almost made it seem like it was the the uh, it was it was the labor unions or it was the uh, the workers that had to uh, now come to the table and and uh, try to make him uh, feel like he's he's a legitimate uh, minister of labor. I mean, it was just so disrespectful. So when I paraphrased the minister and said, "Get over it," um, I think that's how many in this committee, certainly how I understood, 
the minister's words here tonight, that he was just saying, he was being flippant, that he was saying, you know, move on, uh, you know, rather than actually acknowledging the pain, acknowledging the impact and the hardship that this has had on Manitoba workers. Um, it's not hard to do, to listen to somebody who's come to this committee and appreciate their perspective. And, uh, you know, and, and, but I guess for this minister, it, it uh, apparently is. Um, there are, there were two specific asks that I heard over and over again from the presenters that came tonight that I think we should, um, you know, we should continue to press the, the minister and the government on. And I'm quite surprised that, uh, that the minister wasn't willing to, to go further in, in their indication of the, uh, this government's willingness to, uh, to reset the relationship. Uh, when, you know, the first ask is, is about as simple as it gets. Stop, the minister should stop interfering in collective bargaining in this province. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is the most basic uh, thing that a minister for labor should be able to, to say. Uh, and it should be the starting point for all negotiations in this province. And it should be the starting point for this new premier. But again, we don't even have that much of a commitment from this government. Um, we've seen the effects. We heard from, uh, for instance, the um, the uh, UMF uh, faculty association folks uh, listening to the University of Manitoba faculty telling us uh, the impacts that has had not just on them, on the university, but on students. That's one of the most blatant examples of what this interference, the, the impact that this interference can have. Um, but, but we know that it's, it goes far and wide. And so I think it's incumbent on the minister. And you know he'll get his opportunity, I guess, at third reading of this bill to, uh, to come out and say very clearly that he's willing to make that commitment that they will stay out of the bargaining process, uh, stop their interference, and, uh, and respect the collective bargaining uh, process here in Manitoba. So that's just the first most basic element that this government could take. But secondly, uh, and again, this was an important part of the presentations here tonight, uh, because we had everybody from the most, uh, you know, sort of knowledgeable uh, labor leaders to uh, average folks who have seen the impact that this, uh, that this legislation has had on their lives, say that it's now incumbent on the, the government to uh, get out of the way and stop their opposition to the application to have this scene, uh, this this case uh, considered before the Supreme Court. Um, you know, we we've argued right from the beginning as uh, as as labor that this is unconstitutional. We now have two different decisions within the province of Manitoba. So let's get this let's get this solved once and for all. And I think there's an opportunity to send this to uh, to the Supreme Court and to have the uh, the government get out of the way. Uh, it seems like a no brainer. If the government is willing to repeal this uh, this bill, then they should be on board with this. But of course, they haven't been to this point. And I asked the minister during his comments whether he would uh, make that step. But of course, he's getting his marching orders from the premier, who still sees this as uh, uh, as a fight she wants to take on. I wonder, you know, and this was uh, this was uh, uh, mentioned and, and uh, suggested by many of our presenters here tonight. You know, I, I wonder if Bill Two really is uh, just about uh, influencing that that uh, consideration by the Supreme Court, and whether by bringing this repeal act, uh, they're trying to influence whether this is heard before the Supreme Court. Again, why would, would a government do that? There's really only one reason. It's ideological at, uh, at its heart. And if that is the case, then uh, shame on this government once again for interfering in uh, the workers' uh, uh, rights here in this province. But again, that was, the, uh, that was the MO of the former premier. It seems to be the MO of the current cabinet, which was you know, sitting around the same cabinet table with the former premier, now with the new premier. They are still on track to do everything they can to interrupt and impact uh, working people in this province. So it's very frustrating. And, uh, you know, I'll just maybe simply end my comments by once again thanking uh, all those folks in, in labor. You know, it, I guess this, this should have been a, 
uh, a bit of a celebration here tonight, a, a happy moment, you know, finally to see Bill 28 die, to see this unconstitutional uh, piece of legislation uh, quashed. You know, let's move through this and let's pass Bill 2. Uh, but what you heard from workers and from the folks who came here tonight is uh, over and over again how disappointed they are that this government continues their practices. And, you know, so if I, if I can just end it just by saying thank you to those uh, folks who came out here tonight. We're not celebrating. We're, we're continuing to stand with you as an opposition. We'll continue to stand with you as you take this to the Supreme Court and, uh, and continue to fight for workers in this province. Um, but, uh, but thank you for the work that you've done to this point. And uh, we look forward to continuing to, uh, to do everything we can to enhance working people's rights here in this province, protect labor and protect their, uh, their uh, constitutional right for uh, free and fair bargaining. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm standing in here today for our, our critic, um, uh, Mr. Lindsay, who uh, I'm not sure if I can say his name when he's not on committee, uh, but Mr. Lindsay, who I know is, uh, is in another committee here tonight, but uh, he sends his, uh, his support to, for this as well, along with the rest of our caucus. Again, we will stand shoulder to shoulder with our uh, labor brothers and sisters and all working people in this province. It's time to address the issues here. Let's get some fair bargaining and let's increase the wages of Manitobans because with inflation at all time highs, it's time now that Manitobans get paid a fair wage for fair work. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Chair. Okay, and, we, and we thank the member uh, for those comments. Uh, during the consideration of a bill, the enacting clause and the title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Is that agreed? Agreed, so ordered. Shall clause one pass? Clause one is accordingly passed. Shall clause two pass? Pass. Clause two is accordingly passed. Shall clause three pass? Pass. Clause three is accordingly passed. Shall clause four pass? Pass. Clause four is accordingly passed. Shall clause five pass? Pass. Clause five is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? Pass. The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? Pass. The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Agreed. 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 The bill shall be reported. Okay, we will now move on to bill number eight, clause by clause. Does the minister responsible for bill eight have an opening statement? I do, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Mr. Gert minister Gertson. Thank you. Um, so I often get questions at second reading and try to answer them uh, at committee. So I'll, I'll try to do that again with a couple of them and then just make a quick comment. Uh, so at committee, um, I believe it was a member for St. John's asked why uh, the education provision wasn't applied to JJPs as well. And, and while it certainly could be, she'll know that JJPs both have a different appointment uh, um qualification significantly different and then different responsibilities than a judge uh, does but that is certainly something that we could look at uh in the future and i give her that uh, that assurance that it would be considered uh there was also a question um just regarding the independence of the judiciary and what has changed in terms of the education portion of this and again this mirrors the federal bill um, which uh, is believed to be the um the way through this in terms of both ensuring that those who are getting appointed to the bench uh, get this uh, education that I think uh, all of us believe is important while not trampling on uh, judicial independence, which we heard about tonight. And I appreciate those comments that came forward tonight. And then there was a question, I think also from the member for St. John's uh, asking um, that a federal change that included requiring judges to put their reasons on the record or in writing when they rule on sexual assault cases, why that, wasn't included in this bill uh, and that is because uh, as she rightfully references the criminal code was changed in may of 2021 uh, that requires judges to make uh, decisions in sexual assault matters to provide reasons for their decisions on the court record or in writing so that it's unnecessary to put in this bill because it applies to decisions uh, in manitoba and uh, all 
to all judges across uh, the country. So I think that addresses uh, the questions that came up at second reading. Um, just a couple of brief comments then. Uh, again, I know that anytime there are changes, and this is true anywhere in the country, to the appointment of judges, processors, there's questions about it. Uh, I restate that uh, this is similar to the federal process uh, that is, has been used now for several years. Um, I believe under the former conservative government, under the current liberal NDP coalition. Um, and, um, you know, my haven't heard any uh, great hues and cries across the country uh, that this process hasn't worked well um, or that it's been overly politicized in, uh, in Canada. I recognize that there's differences between Canada and Manitoba, but we are part of Canada and, and the judiciary, you know, essentially operates uh, the same way in, in almost all parts of, of Canada under a common law system. Um, but I'm mindful, you know, that these changes should always be, uh, you know, reasoned and considered. And I'm, and I'm grateful for the groups that came out to present uh, tonight. There was a theme that was going on. I think the member for St. John's Equity that uh, this erodes the public's confidence in the justice system. Um, I'd remind members that the bill, uh, it predates me, I think, as a minister of justice. So it must have been before the legislature since at least uh, winter of last year, maybe fall of last year. Um, so several months anyway. Um, and we had committees tonight where the public who, if they feel that there's a lack of confidence uh, and this being eroded, they certainly could have presented tonight virtually or, or in person. And we had three presenters, one representing provincial judges, one representing defense lawyers, and one representing uh, lawyers in general to the Bar Association. That, at least on the face of it, doesn't scream that the public is uh, feeling, uh, after months of consideration of this bill, there's there's an erosion of public confidence. Of course, the opposition members could have brought forward uh, folks. Uh, they could have certainly asked people to come and make presentations. Um, and the three presenters we had are all integrated, but important parts of the judicial system. Um, but not, I think, what people would generally consider to be lay people who the member for St. John's is suggesting are up in arms over a lack of a lack of confidence because of this bill. So uh, I'm not entirely buying the narrative that the public uh, is uh, is feeling an erosion of confidence because that hasn't been demonstrated um, in correspondence or in public presentations. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be mindful uh, of these things and the balances and the uh, independence and all of those things um, are reflective in the federal process. They're reflective of this process, um, but as always, uh, we'll continue to, to monitor things as they continue on. So with those uh, brief comments, Mr. Chairperson, um, happy to hear from the official opposition critic and then uh, proceed to class by class. We thank the minister for those comments. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? Ms. Fontaine. Uh, miigwech. I want to say miigwech to all of the uh, presenters who um, took advantage of our democratic uh, process, which I know all of us around the table are um, uh, proud of and grateful for that we are uh, one of the few uh, jurisdictions that do this. Um, I really appreciated all of the uh, analysis and commentary in respect to Bill 8, um, uh, which echoed a lot of the uh, concerns that I've had since uh, Bill 8 was introduced. I do want to just uh, clarify the minister in, in respect of saying that there's like, you know, public con you know, concerns or outrage about Bill 8. I, I never once said that. I, I not once. And you can go back into Hansard uh, and review that. I never once said that. I mean, the, the vast majority of the, the public don't even know what we do in here in, in the Manitoba legislative uh, building. And so I'm pretty sure the public isn't paying attention to Bill 8 right now and the, you know, the amendments to the Judicial Appointment Committee. However, I, I would submit that um, if they did know that this bill uh, was before the House and is about to receive royal assent in, in a week and a bit, uh, they would find concern with uh, stacking the deck of a Judicial Appointment Committee. And, and there's you know, I know that the the minister, again, you know, re kept cr trying to say, you know, like the challenges and the challenges. But let me just say again for the record, there is no challenge. The, this is a, a, is a, a PC government and, and more specifically uh, a Cameron Friesen challenge, created challenge, because nobody and their 
Yeah, just remind the member that you not to use a first name. It would be Mr. Mr. Friesen. Um, rookie mistake. Ms. Fontaine, please continue. I'll figure this out. Rookie mistake, I apologize. Mr. Friesen, uh, man-made uh, challenge. Because nobody in 35 years has asked for these changes to the Judicial uh, Appointment Committee. And so I want to be clear that there, there is no challenge. And it really does beg the question why Mr. Friesen um, thought that this was an issue. Like, why all of a sudden something that has never come up, never come up to anybody in respect of there being problems with the Judicial Appointment Committee and somehow it's unfair or it's this or it's that, none of that has ever come up. So how did Mr. Friesen come up with this? You know, it really does uh, beg the question why all of a sudden this was important. And I recall like a year, a year and a half ago, I can't remember what it is now, you know, there was um, a judicial appointment committee for uh, judges. And as you know, uh, as the minister knows, I did get up in the house and ask questions because we know that Minister Friesen had the list I think of three judge or three uh, lawyers or the list of yeah I'm pretty sure they're lawyers, uh, three individuals at any rate, um, who were submitted to Minister Friesen, who Minister Friesen didn't do anything with that list, uh, and then went back and and uh, tried to look at another appointment or whatever it was. So you know I, I would submit and of course nobody's probably going to admit this or whatever, but I would submit that it this bill, these changes that nobody asked for, derive themselves or are predicated upon um, that moment that Mr. Friesen was given the list by the Judicial Committee uh, and didn't like the names on the list. That's what I think this is all about. Whether or not we will ever be able to prove that uh, is probably uh, not going to happen. But again, it makes absolutely no sense that Bill 8, that these changes are before us this evening. It makes absolutely no sense. Nobody asked for it. Nobody wants it. Uh, the public don't even know that it's happening. Our presenters didn't, d you know, don't want them. So, uh, you know, I, I would ask the minister, you know, I would ask the minister, I, I'm, I'm hoping to make an amendment or present an amendment at report stage amendment um, to uh, delete those sections. And I'm going to ask the minister to consider that, to consider stacking the deck of the Judicial Appointment Committee. There's no, and, and certainly stacking the deck and removing the chief judge. There, again, there's like, who thought about removing the chief judge in all of the chief judge, uh, judge's expertise and capacity and infrastructure to do this work? Who thought that was a good thing? Like, who just sits there and says, let's get rid of the chief judge as the chairperson? Like, who does that? So I, I'm, I, you know, I'm officially asking the minister to delete those sections and move on with the rest of the bill. Miigwech. And we thank the member. During the consideration of a bill, the enacting clause and the title are postponed until all other clauses have been considered in their proper order. Also, if there is an agreement from the committee, the chair will call clauses in blocks that conform to pages with the understanding that we will stop at any particular clause or clauses where members may have comments, questions, or amendments to propose. Is that agreed? Agreed, agreed. and so ordered. Shall clauses one and two pass? Pass. Clauses one and two are accordingly passed. Shall clause three pass? Pass. Clause three is accordingly passed. Shall clauses four through seven pass? Pass. Clauses four through seven are accordingly passed. Shall clauses eight and nine pass? Pass. Clauses eight and nine are accordingly passed. Shall clause 10 pass? Pass. Clause 10 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 11 pass? Pass. Clause 11 is accordingly passed. Shall the enacting clause pass? Pass. The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? Pass. pass. The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Agreed. Agreed. The bill shall be reported. We'll now proceed with clause by clause on bill number 17. 
Does the minister responsible have an opening statement? I do, Mr. Chair. Minister Gertsen. Uh, thank you. Again, questions at second reading. Uh, one was posed by the um, Honourable Member for River Heights. I, uh, I'm not sure if he's still in the room. I can't see him from Steinbach, but um, I'll leave this on hand, sir, to, uh, if, so he can at least hear it. He asked, I think, a good question about um, if there's a conflict between the Act uh, and the CFX Act, which takes priority in the circumstance. Uh, response from the department officials and consultation with others, I'm sure, is if an allegation of child abuse is made to a child and family services agency, CFS, the agency decides whether the allegation causes it to suspect that a child is in need of protection. If there are concurrent family court proceedings involving a parenting dispute under the Family Law Act, the parenting proceeding would be held in abeyance pending the outcome of the child abuse investigation. So in these types of cases, the CFS Act takes priority over proceedings under other acts. Uh, Mr. Gerard also asked about um, where there are circumstances, um, and if we could be specific about um, arrangements that could be made out of court. Uh, for initial arrangements, they, uh, the parties could reach a consent agreement independently or with the help of a lawyer and enter into a separation agreement to formalize it. They could pursue mediation to reach a consent agreement and enter into a separation agreement. They could agree to have a family arbitrator make a decision and award, uh, or they could ask the child support service to make a child support calculation decision. To change an existing arrangement or a court order, parents have the following options, where parenting arrangements or support is set out in an agreement to reach an agreement independently with the help of a lawyer or through mediation and enter into an amending agreement. Uh, where the parenting arrangements or support are set out in a court order by arbitration where the parties agree that the support provisions of the family arbitration award will be enforced by maintenance enforcement instead of the court order, where the child support is set out in an agreement, a court order, or a family arbitration award by asking the child support service to make a recalculation decision, and where the support is set out in an agreement or a court order by signing a maintenance enforcement program agreement to change to allow the MEP to enforce a different amount of support. So I hope that that answers the member for uh, River Heights question. And then he also asked a question about whether we would be reviewing um, some of the guidelines. And, and just for his information, Manitoba's child support guidelines, they mirror the federal child support guidelines. There are child support tables for each province and territory that determine the base amount of each child support, depending on where the parent required to pay resides. Uh, this approach provides consistency and predictability for Manitoba families. And so in terms of that particular uh, provision, um, we align ourselves with the federal government's uh, child support guidelines so their consistency across uh, Canada. Other than that, I want to thank uh, the various uh, family law practitioners who are involved in the consultations um, and uh, who presented tonight. Uh, this is a complex area of law. Changes have a pretty deep impact on, on families and practitioners, and we rely significantly on their advice and the experience of the system. Um, I think uh, we heard that there was not only a collaborative approach, but general consensus that these are supportable measures moving forward. Uh, this is an ever-evolving area of law, though, and I'm sure to evolve again, either under my ministry or my time as minister or somebody else's time as minister. So I, um, I, I appreciate the collaboration and the work of the department and, and the officials in my department and also those in the private bar who engage in the discussion. So with that, I look forward, as I always do, from hearing from the member for St. John's and her comments. Uh, we thank the minister for his statement. Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? Uh, Ms. Fontaine, go ahead. Uh, miigwech. Uh, miigwech to uh, our uh, sole presenter uh, this evening. Um, Bill 17 repeals the Family Maintenance Act and replaces it with two new acts. It's vital that provincial and federal laws keep up with modern times. Uh, family structures have changed and our legislation must accurately reflect Manitoba families. Bill 17 uh, replaces concepts of custody and access respecting children with the concepts of parenting arrangements, parenting time, decision-making responsibility. Bill 17 also expands access to child and, and spousal support.
by making it possible for children to apply for ch child support and clarifies under what circumstances a foreign uh, support quarter, a court order should be enforced. Uh, certainly, Bill 17 is a step in the right direction. That's why we are um, we're glad to support it. I think that, uh, as our presenter said this evening, um, you know there are times when we can uh, come together and support good legislation, and I and I would say that this is one of those times that um, this is uh, good legislation moving us forward in a progressive and more equitable uh, manner, reflecting uh, the changes that occur in family law. Miigwech. We thank the member for those uh, comments. So due to the size and structure of this bill, I would like to propose the following order of consideration for the committee's consideration. With the understanding that we may stop at any point where members have questions or wish to propose amendments, I propose that we call the bill in the following order. Schedule A, pages 3 through 110, called in blocks conforming to pages. Schedule B, pages 111 through 212, called in blocks conforming to pages. Schedule C, pages 213 through 229, called in blocks conforming to pages. Enacting clauses and coming into force clauses, pages one and two, and then followed by the bill title. Is it agreed as an appropriate order of consideration for bill 17? Agreed and so ordered. We'll first consider schedule A, pages three through 10. Shall clause one pass? Pass. Clause one is accordingly passed. Shall clauses two through five pass? Pass. Clauses two through five are accordingly passed. Shall clauses six through nine pass? Pass. Clauses six through nine are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 10 through 11 pass? Pass. Clauses 10 through 11 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 12 pass? Pass. Clause 12 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 13 pass? Pass. Clause 13 is accordingly passed. So clause 14 through 16 pass. Pass. Clauses 14 through 16 are accordingly passed. So clauses 17 and 18 pass. Pass. Clauses 17 and 18 are accordingly passed. So clause 19 pass. Pass. Clause 19 is accordingly passed. So clause 20 pass. Pass. Clause 20 is accordingly passed. So clause 21 pass. Pass. Clause 21 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 22 pass? Pass. Clause 22 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 23 pass? Pass. Clause 23 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 24 pass? Pass. Clause 24 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 25 pass? Pass. Sorry, I'm going to repeat that one. Shall Clauses 25 and 26 pass? Pass. Clauses 25 and 26 are accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 27 through 29 pass? Pass. Clauses 27 through 29 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 30 pass? Pass. Clause 30 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 31 and 32 pass? Pass. Clauses 31 and 32 are accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 33 and 34 pass? Pass. Clauses 33 and 34 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 35 pass? Pass. Clause 35 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 36 and 37 pass? Clauses pass. 36 and 37 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 38 pass? Pass. Clause 38 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 39 and 40 pass? Uh, clauses pass. 39 and 40 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 41 pass? Pass. Clause 41 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 42 through 44 pass? Uh, clauses 42 through 44 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 45 pass? Clause 45 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 46 and 47 pass? Clauses pass. 46 and 47 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 48 pass? Clause 48 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 49 and 50 pass? Clauses 49 and 50 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 51 pass? Clause 51 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 52 pass? Yes. Clause 52 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 53 through 55 pass? Yes. Clauses 53 through 55 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 56 pass? Yes. Clause 56 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 57 pass? Yes. Clause 57 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 58 pass? Yes. Clause 58 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 59 pass? 
Pass. Clause 59 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 60 pass? Clause nice. 60 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 61 pass? Pass. Clause 61 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 62 pass? Clause pass. 62 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 63 through 65 pass? Pass. Clauses 63 through 65 are accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 66 and 67 pass? Pass. Clauses 66 and 67 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 68 pass? Pass. Clause 68 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 69 and 70 pass? Pass. Clauses 69 and 70 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 71 pass? Pass. Clause 71 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 72 pass? Pass. Clause 72 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 73 pass? Pass. Clause 73 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 74 pass? Pass. Clause 74 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 75 and 76 pass? Pass. Clauses 75 and 76 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 77 and 78 pass? Pass. Clauses 77 and 78 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 79 pass? Pass. Clause 79 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 80 pass? Pass. Clause 80 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 81 pass? Pass. Clause 81 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 82 through 84 pass? Pass. Clauses 82 through 84 accordingly passed. Shall clauses 85 and 86 pass? Pass. Clauses 85 and 86 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 87 and 88 pass? Pass. Clauses 87 and 88 are accordingly passed. Thank you. Shall clause 89 pass? Pass. Clause 89 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 90 and 91 pass? Pass. Clauses 90 and 91 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 92 through 94 pass? Pass. Clauses 93 through 94 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 95 pass? Pass. Clause 95 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 96 and 97 pass? Pass. Clauses 96 and 97 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 98 and 99 pass? Pass. Clauses 98 and 99 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 100 pass? Pass. Clause 100 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 101 pass? Pass. Clause 101 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 102 pass? Pass. Clause 102 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 103 pass? Clause pass. 103 is accordingly passed. Shall 104 pass? Pass. Clause 104 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 105 pass? Pass. Clause 105 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 106 and 107 pass? Pass. Clauses 106 and 107 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 108 and 109 pass? Pass. Clauses 108 and 109 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 110 pass? Pass. Clause number 110 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 111 pass? Pass. Clause 111 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 112 and 113 pass? Pass. Clauses 113, pardon me. 112 and 113 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 114 through 116 pass? Uh, clauses 114 through 116 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 117 and 118 pass? Clauses uh, 117 and 118 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 119 through 121 pass? Pass. Uh, clauses 119 through 121 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 122 pass? Pass. Clause 122 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 123 pass? Pass. Clause 123 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 124 through 126 pass? Pass. Clauses 124 through 126 are accordingly passed. So we'll now consider Schedule B, pages 111 through 212. Shall Clause 1 pass? Pass. Clause 1 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 2 and 3 pass? Clauses pass. 2 and 3 are accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 4 through 7 pass? Clauses pass. 4 through 7 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 8 pass? Clause pass. 8 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 9 pass? Pass. Clause 9 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 10 pass? Pass. Clause 10 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 11? Clauses 11 and 12 pass? Pass. Clauses 11 and 12 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 13 through 15 pass? 
Pass. Clauses pass. 13 through 15 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 16 through 18 pass? Clauses pass. 16 pass. through 18 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 19 pass? Pass. Clause 19 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 20 pass? Clause pass. 20 pass. is accordingly passed. Shall clause 21 and 22 pass? Pass. Clauses 21 and 22 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 23 pass? pass. Clause 23 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 24 pass? Pass. 24 is accordingly passed. Oh, I'm sorry. Shall clause 24 pass? Uh, okay. Pass. Clause 24 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 25 and 26 pass? Uh, pass. Clauses 25 and 26 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 27 through 29 pass? pass. Clauses 27 through 29 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 30 pass? Uh, clause 30 pass. is accordingly passed. Shall clause 31 pass? Uh, clause 31 pass. is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 32 and 33 pass? Pass. Clauses 32 and 33 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 34 and 35 pass? Uh, clauses pass. 34 and 35 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 36 pass? Clause pass. 36 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 37 and 38 pass? Uh, clauses 37 and 38 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 39 pass? Clause pass. 39 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 40 pass? Clause 40 pass. is accordingly passed. Shall clause 41 pass? pass? Clause 41 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 42 pass? Pass. Clause 42 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 43 and 44 pass? Pass. Clauses 43 and 44 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 45 pass? Pass. Clause 45 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 46 pass? Pass. Clause 46 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 47 pass? Clause pass. 47 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 48 and 49 pass? Pass. pass. Clauses 48 and 49 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 50 pass? Pass. Clause 50 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 51 pass? Clause 51 pass. is accordingly passed. Shall clause 52 pass? Pass. Clause 52 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 53 pass? Pass. Clause 53 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 54 pass? Pass. Clause 54 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 55 pass? Clause 55 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 56 pass? Pass. Clause 56 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 57 and 58 pass? Pass. Clauses 57 and 58 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 59 pass? Clause pass. 59 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 60 pass? pass? Clause 60 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 61 through 63 pass? pass? Clauses 61 through 63 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 64 through 66 pass? pass. Clauses 64 through 66 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 67 pass? Uh, pass. Clause 67 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 68 pass? Clause 68 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 69 through 71 pass? Uh, clauses pass. 69 through 71 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 72 and 73 pass? Clauses, pass. clauses 72 and 73 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 74 pass? Clause pass. 74 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 75 through 79 pass? Pass. Clauses 75 through 79 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 80 pass? Pass. Clause 80 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 81 through 83 pass? Pass. Clauses 81 through 83 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 84 through 86 pass? Pass. Clauses 84 through 86 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 87 and 88 pass? pass. Clauses 87 and 88 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 89 pass? pass? Clause 89 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 90 pass? pass? Clause 90 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 91 pass? Pass. Clause 91 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 92 through 94 pass? Pass. pass. Clause, clauses 92 through 94 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 95 pass? 
Clause 95 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 96 pass? Pass. Clause 96 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 97 pass? Pass. Clause 97 is accordingly passed. Shall Clause 98 pass? Pass. Clause 98 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 99 and 100 pass? Pass. Clauses 99 and 100 are accordingly passed. Shall Clause 101 pass? Pass. I have that different. No. I have just. Shall Clause 101 pass? Pass. Clause 101 is accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 102 and 103 pass? Pass. Clauses 101 and. Pardon me. 102 and 103 are accordingly passed. Shall Clauses 104 through 106 pass? Pass. Clauses 104 through 106 are accordingly passed. We'll now consider Schedule C, pages 213 through 229. So clauses 1 and 2 pass. Pass. Clauses 1 and 2 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 3 through 5 pass? Pass. Clauses 3 through 5 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 6 pass? Pass. Clause 6 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 7 and 8 pass? Clauses 7 and 8 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 9 through 12 pass? Pass. Clauses 9 through 12 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 13 through 15 pass? Pass. Clauses 13 through 15 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 16 and 17 pass? Pass. Clauses 16 and 17 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 18 pass? Pass. Clause 18 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 19 pass? Clause 19 is accordingly passed. Shall clause 20 pass? Pass. Clause 20 is accordingly passed. Shall clauses 21 through 24 pass? Pass. Clauses 21 through 24 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 25 through 27 pass? Pass. Clauses 25 through 27 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 28 through 30 pass? Pass. Clauses 28 through 30 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 31 and 32 pass? Pass. Clauses 31 and 32 are accordingly passed. Shall clauses 33 through 35 pass? Pass. Clauses 33 through 35 are accordingly passed. Shall clause 36 pass? Pass. Clause 36 is accordingly passed. We'll now consider the enacting clauses and coming into force clauses on pages one and two. Shall clauses one through four pass? Pass. Clauses one through four are accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? Pass. The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Absolutely. Agreed, the bill shall be reported. The nine, the hour being 9.51, what is the will of the committee? Committee rise.